The rain poured down in sheets, with such ferocity and intensity that it didn't seem as if it were originating from the skies. Instead, to the young man who was running through it, it seemed as if the rain were coming from everywhere at once. He had run from the house, the house that was no longer home. Home, after all, is where the heart is. The young man was all too well aware of his heart's present location. It was scattered in small, bloody ruins, on the filth-ridden ground of a place called Crime Alley. It lay intermixed with the blood of two people, two corpses, and a leering monster of a man glowering down at the boy. The boy had frozen, not out of fear for himself. That was long gone. No, he'd frozen as he'd sensed the blood of the two people cooling in the evening. Frozen as his soul, it seemed, had left him. Then had come the sirens and the lights. There was nothing he wanted to deal with, nothing he wanted to face, nothing he wanted to do except to get away, to escape, to hide, hide from the mourners and the ghosts of his parents, hide from the evil things he'd learned. That's when there was a crack of thunder that seemed to explode directly over his head, and his feet went out from under him. It was as if the earth had decided to bury him right there and then. Before he fully realized what had happened, the lower half of his body had simply vanished, sucked down into a cascading pit of dirt. It was as though he were about to plunge into a tunnel that would drop him straight into the center of the earth. He sank lower, up to his armpits, the dirt covering his head. Then he dropped through the hole and vanished from sight. It seemed to him that he'd been falling forever. He might have fallen six feet or twenty, or two hundred. It was rather an abrupt stop, and he thudded to the ground. Dirt and mud continued to rain down on him. He rolled out of the way and scrambled to his feet. And then he realized that it was missing. It had fallen from him during his plunge. It was all he could do to stifle a sob, losing it. Losing his last connection with his parents was a calamity that threatened to overwhelm him. His questing fingers seized on a small, solid object, and he pulled it to himself with joy. Then he looked up. The ceiling was moving. And at that moment, high above, the moon emerged from behind its clouds. Faint streams of light poured through this hole that had been the young man's unexpected entranceway. Now he was able to make out just what precisely was above him. Bats. Hundreds, thousands of them, hanging, dangling from every crevice, their wings flexing slightly, their eyes glittering. The young man froze, afraid that the slightest motion might set them off. But there was nothing. Beyond the slight stirring of their leathery wings, there was no movement. Slowly, ever so slowly, the young man eased himself away from them. At one end of the cavern, there was an opening outward. He heard a rushing of water. He made his way toward the hole and peered through and down. He quickly sensed that there was no easy way down. You'll have to build stairs. It was as if another voice had spoken within his head. The bats began to stir. It was as if they had heard it too. Streams wide enough. You could put the boat there. There was a gentle scraping from below. Below as if something were coming up towards him. He tried to peer down at it, and no, he wasn't imagining it. There was something there, something large, the size of a human. But he knew immediately it was anything but. Let me out, said the young man as the thing came nearer, nearer still. Let me in, came the response, and the creature lifted its head to gaze at him. Its eyes were burning red, and its ears tall, and it was covered with dark, matted fur. There was fire in the creature's eyes, fire in its heart, a massive bat image that was enveloped in flame, and it surrounded the young man. The creature drew the struggling young man to him as the moonlight held steady. Everywhere now, the bats were shrieking, as if roaring approval or joining in a song of celebration. And then the young man's struggles ceased, and suddenly his world made sense again. 
Bats flew through the light from above. Hundreds, thousands of screeching voices came together in unison. Hey, Eddie. Edward Nigma looked up at the hulking lummox and his snickering cronies who stood nearby. The eighth-grade lad blew air impatiently between his lips. It was library study hall, and Edward was working on his fifth crossword puzzle in the last fifteen minutes. He had thick brown hair and an expressive face that didn't seem to be made of flesh so much as rubber. Behind his eyes there was a fiery intelligence that did not suffer fools gladly. Got something on your mind, Raymond? Got a riddle for you. Edward glanced around, but there was no teacher anywhere in sight. He put the puzzle down and sighed. <sighs> okay, what's the riddle? What has four wheels and flies? Edward looked at him pityingly. A garbage truck, he said. Raymond's face clouded. You heard it. Just a wild guess. <laughs> he snickered slightly. But his private amusement was cut short by Raymond's rough hand, grabbing him by the back of the hair and snapping his head back. Ed gasped. How'd you like me to bend you into a question mark, funny guy? Want to hear another riddle? Legit? Ed asked. A famous one? Real old? Go on. What walks on four legs in the morning, two in the afternoon, and three in the evening? I don't know. What? Raymond. It was the stern, angry voice of a teacher, Mr. Pike, heading their way. Raymond, he said. Study doesn't usually require students twisting someone's head in a painful manner. Raymond seemed to study him with a sullen glare that Pike sensed probably extended to Neanderthal times. Then Raymond and his pals moved off. Mr. Pike turned to Edward and said, And a little less smart-mouthing from you would also be in order. Yes, sir, Edward said in his most contrite voice. And you shouldn't be sitting around doing puzzle books. This is the library for crying out loud. Read one of the books. Already have, sir, all of them. I have an unquenchable thirst for knowledge. Pike saw the intensity with which Edward Nigma had spoken and thought, Son of a gun means it. After a moment, he tossed a newspaper down in front of Edward. Here, read today's paper yet? Gotham Globe? No, sir. Pike nodded once and then walked away. Edward immediately picked up the paper. He didn't have to read it. Not immediately, in any event. His mind would snap pictures of each page, to be digested at a convenient time later on. He stopped dead at the front page. The headline was somewhat sordid. Thomas Wayne murdered. Only child survives. Subheadings above the article read, Prominent doctor and wife slain in robbery. Unidentified gunman leaves only child unharmed. It was the child who caught Edward's eye. He saw there, in Bruce Wayne's face, an intensity that mirrored his own. There was Bruce, in a moment of raw emotion, his parents just having been cruelly taken from him. And there was no self-pity, just cold, hard anger. He found the young man fascinating, as if he had discovered a soulmate of sorts. They were very different, of course. Wayne, born to the purple, as it were. Rich boy, all the breaks best schools, best education, best everything. Edward Nigma was born to a lower middle class family, no breaks, inadequate schools, least of everything. The equanimity with which Wayne was reacting to stress garnered Edward's admiration. As Eddie left the library, the newspaper was yanked out of his hand. He spun round to find himself facing Raymond and one of his chief henchmen. What's the answer to the riddle? Raymond grabbed him by the front of the shirt. There's no teacher around now. You better tell me. All right, all right. The answer is man. Man, said Raymond in confusion. Yeah. In the morning of his life, man crawls on all fours. In the afternoon of his life, man walks on two legs. And in the evening of his life, he walks on two legs with a cane for his third leg. It's the riddle of the Sphinx. It's stupid, Raymond said. With tremendous frustration, Edward said, It's a metaphor. It's... It's stupid, Raymond said, and he threw Edward down with tremendous force. 
Edward's skull struck the curb with a sickening crack. He lay there, unmoving, but his eyes stared skyward in disjointed confusion. Raymond's henchman whispered, I think you killed him. He tugged at Raymond's sleeve. Come on, let's go. Raymond paused in confusion, and then, with a final defiant bit of anger, he tossed the newspaper down next to Edward. From a place very far away, Edward heard the pounding of their feet as they ran off. He turned his head slightly to see the newspaper on the sidewalk. The picture of Bruce Wayne stared back at him. Why had the world put both himself and Bruce into such untenable positions? Why were brutes in charge of things? When would matters improve? Suddenly, everything made perfect sense. Suddenly, his life's mission stretched out before him, his ambitions clear. He was bleeding and might be very sick or perhaps even about to die. But none of that altered the fact that everything made perfect sense. Questions filled his mind. And he had all the answers. Harvey Dent, district attorney of Gotham City, stood on the flat roof, looking out over the array of similar buildings that spread out before him, like an ocean of tar paper. It was a low-rent section of Gotham, a housing project funded by the Wayne Foundation. Dent's face was craggy. His black hair, shortly cropped and graying slightly at the temples, his thin lips were pursed, and he licked them briskly as the cold air dried them out. He found his thoughts wandering to the first occasion he ever met Bruce Wayne, the head of the Wayne Foundation. We don't want people to have to live in fear of crime, in fear of their lives, Dent had said. It had been that comment that seemed to rivet Wayne's attention. To Dent's astonishment, Wayne had single-handedly offered to kick in half the money needed to fund the project. He looked out again across the rooftops. He could easily understand why his caller wanted to meet him here. Surprise was impossible. No way on this flat terrain could any cops be hiding or any sort of trap be sprung. It would be seen coming a mile away. Dent's shadow moved, but Dent didn't. His head snapped round to catch sight of the silhouette moving out of Dent's shadow. The figure stood to its full height, the scalloped cape flaring out, dark eyes invisible behind the mask and pointed ear cowl. They stood there for a long moment, taking the measure of one another. When the caped figure spoke, it was in a voice low, just above a whisper. The local polls place you fairly low in public opinion. You're not planning to run again for D.A., are you? Dent said, I've been thinking about returning to private practice, yes. You could be the best D.A. this city has ever known, said Batman. I can be of help to you. My investigations can give you leads, point you in the right direction. We have the same goal, you and I. We're just two sides of it. Two sides, echoed Dent. I'm thinking about getting out of this rat race, and you want me to stick my neck out further. Yes, Batman confirmed. But I won't let anyone chop it off. You'll protect me, you're saying, from any dire consequences of your investigations? As much as humanly possible. Dent sighed. <sighs> Maybe we can come to some sort of accord. That's good enough for now, said Batman. Then, without even seeming to move his feet, he drifted backwards and melted into the shadows. Hey, shouted Harvey Dent, why are you working so hard to convince me to stay in office, eh? Because, floated back a voice from the darkness, I care. And then there was a brief rustling, that could have been a cape, or perhaps it was massive wings, and it was gone. Now. Dr. Chase Meridian firmly believed that all stories about how dangerous Gotham City was were just that, stories. This wasn't the Wild West, after all. 
As she walked briskly down the street during a busy lunch hour, she felt the pulse of humanity around her. Enveloped as she was by walls of moving life, Dr. Meridian had her thesis reinforced for her. This was a city, a bustling metropolis. Here was a place where people lived and worked, hoped and dreamed, and tried to deal with the fear that pervaded every moment of their existence. Some hid from it, some fought it, and some... some hid and fought back. Then she thought she saw something, a quick rustling of a cape high above a ledge, yet hidden in the shadows. She stopped, looked up, and watched a small flock of pigeons arc skyward. It was then, at that moment, when she stopped moving, that the good doctor became an immediate target. It was at her most distracted that she was the most vulnerable. The purse snatcher seemed to appear from nowhere. Before Dr. Meridian even knew what was happening, he had snagged her brand new leather bag and was hightailing it on foot. He slipped in and out of spaces in the flow of humanity with a skill born of long practice. Stop him! shouted Chase Meridian. She started after him, but she knew there was no way in hell she was going to catch the little cretin. The thief darted around a hot dog cart, around a derelict, and now there was no one between him and the entrance to a subway station. At the exact moment that the thief's attention was diverted by a passerby, a slim, muscular youth darted across the roof of a car. He grabbed a lamp post, and using it as his axis, he swung his legs around and slammed his feet squarely into the thief's head. The next moment the thief was on the ground with blood pouring from his nose. He looked around in confusion and then saw his attacker, a sawed-off runt with dark hair and a smug expression. "'Stop him!' came a female voice from behind. And from off to the left came another voice, male, deep and alarmed, shouting, "'Richard!' Angry and upset people converging on him was enough of a cue for the thief to realize that this little endeavor was finished. "'There he goes!' came a woman's shout as the thief vanished down the stairs to the subway. The teen turned in the direction of the cry and held up the purse. "'It's okay,' he called. "'I got it back!' His mouth continued to hang open as the woman emerged from the crowd into view. She was attractive, extremely shapely, with a rounded face, lovely blonde hair, and an air of total dishevelment because of her run. "'Calm down. Here you go,' he said." From another direction came a tall, muscular man who bore a striking resemblance to the young man. The man saw the boy, the woman saw the purse, and both of them said, Oh, thank God, at the same time. Is this your son? she asked. Yes, it is. He's very brave, Mr. Grayson. I'm John. This is Richard. Mr. Grayson, I'm Dr. Chase Meridian. Richard, you've earned a reward. Great, said Richard. But his father immediately said, No, that's quite all right, Doctor. The benefit should be in the act itself. Isn't that right, Richard? Absolutely, Dad, said Richard through gritted teeth. You know, said Dr. Meridian, I'm doing some studies of people who think exactly along those lines. Would you be interested in spending some time in a series of visits? John Grayson caught on quickly. You're a psychiatrist, he said. That's right. "'We're not in town all that long,' said Grayson hastily, just passing through. "'But I'm glad we were able to help you out. Good luck to you.' And with that he trundled Richard away. "'Were you out of your mind?' demanded John. "'I don't know,' said Richard. "'What was the hurry?' They were walking along the edge of Gotham Park, and John dropped down to a bench. "'I've run into people like that from time to time,' said Grayson. The moment they find out we're trapeze artists, they want to start getting into our heads, get into the entire cheating death business. But you're the major issue under discussion, jumping into the middle of a crime situation. That was crazy. Dick grinned lopsidedly. But we're in the cheating death business. We always have been. Richard, said his father, risking death is one thing, but staring it straight in the face is something else again. Arkham Asylum was a dark and terrifying place. To the normal asylums were consigned those who were a danger to themselves. To the abnormal asylums went those who were a danger to society. It was said that Arkham got those who were a danger to God. This was an exaggeration, of course, but not by much. 
The orderly's name was Richter, and Richter was in deep, deep trouble. His mind was dwelling on the people to whom he owed money, the run of bad luck with the horses and at cards. He went past cell after cell in the maximum security building. His focus was utterly on the door that was up and to the right. Room 22. Next to the door was a keypad. He punched in the numbers and heard a soft click. The electronic door had unlatched. He took a deep breath and then eased the door open, pulling his cleaning cart in behind him. There was a single stream of light in the cell coming from a barred window overhead. The single occupant of the cell was partly visible. Richter could hear something whirring through the air rhythmically, something small and metallic tossed in the air, landing in the occupant's hand. Mm. Mr. Dent, said Richter, um, it's me, Richter. We know it's you, came the voice Richter called Dent. He was only distantly related to the Harvey Dent who had met with Batman all that time ago. Nominally, they shared a body, but that was all. The mind was something else again. I brought what you asked for, said Richter. No sound, save for that up and down of the metallic object. Richter reached down into the cleaning cart and pulled out a pair of goggles and an acetylene torch. Cut through the bars in no time. Then he paused. You... You remember the deal? You promised me half a million if I helped you escape. There was a two-second silence. Half a mil is yours, came Dent's voice. Unless, of course. Unless what? Another pause. And then something was thrust into the light. Richter saw it was a double-headed coin. On one side... The profile of Lady Liberty was pristine, while the other had been disfigured. "'Would you be interested in double or nothing?' came Dent's voice. "'A flip of the coin decides.' The gambling instincts pounded through Richter's head. "'All right,' he said. "'You're on.' "'Call it,' said Dent. "'Clean side,' he called. The coin seemed to hang in mid-air, then it spiraled to the floor and landed, scarred side up. Too bad, said Dent. There was a sudden swift movement that Richter barely even had time to register. Then he felt a sharp pinch at his throat and a warmth trickling down it. He put his hand to the source of the warmth, and his hand came away, coated with his own blood. Richter went to his knees. His already blurring eyes managed to make out what Dent was now holding in his other hand, a double-edged razor blade. His mouth moved, forming the word. Why? Why? Dent sounded genuinely puzzled. Isn't that obvious? It was double or nothing. Nothing means no money, no life, nothing, null, void. Two times zero is... Zero. Dent stepped over him. He placed the goggles over his face and fired up the torch, pushing back the darkness. The right side of his face was much as it had been back when he had had his meeting with Batman. The left side of his face looked like a relief map of purgatory. Except in this purgatory, there would never be any redemption or forgiveness. It was the chief psychiatrist of Arkham Asylum, Dr. Burton, paying a routine visit, who later found the body and the words written in blood, Richter's blood, on the wall of the cell. The bat must die. The granite and glass towers of the Gotham City skyline shimmered in the autumn sun, hanging low in the western sky. Bruce Wayne's helicopter sliced through the air smoothly. His attention was squarely on the video screen situated directly in front of him. There was a picture of Harvey Dent, and the newscaster, appropriately grim, was saying, 
And in Gotham City last night, ex-District Attorney Harvey Dent escaped from Arkham Asylum for the criminally insane. Dent, once Gotham's leading contender for mayor, was horribly scarred by underworld kingpin boss Maroney during an indictment hearing. Dent, whose resulting left brain damage transformed him into a violent criminal, launched a grisly crime spree before being captured by the Batman. Reported to have sworn revenge on the Dark Knight, he is extremely dangerous. Words, just words, didn't come close to the core of guilt that Wayne carried with him to this day. It was one of those moments when he had done everything right, and it had still gone horribly wrong. There he had been, at Maroney's indictment, seated some rows back in disguise watching Harvey Dent, who was cross-examining the underworld kingpin. As Harvey Dent had slowly and methodically torn him to shreds, watching Maroney had been like watching a deflating balloon become smaller and shriveled and pathetic. By the time Dent was finished with him, it had seemed like there was nothing left. There had been, though. No one but no one was going to get away with embarrassing and humiliating boss Maroney. Hey, Dent, cross-examine this, Maroney had shouted, standing in the witness box. His hand had dipped into his pocket, and he had yanked out a small vial. His throw had been smooth and flawless. If Harvey had just stepped back or ducked or anything... But he stood bolt still as the vial's contents splashed all over the left half of Harvey's face. Bruce Wayne would never forget that hideous, unspeakable moment, nor the sound of the acid bubbling and burning and devouring Harvey's face. That night he'd come to the hospital as Batman. Harvey was beyond pain. Instead, he was looking up at Batman with his one good eye, and there was a look of hate and betrayal and anger. Bruce Wayne was jostled from his thoughts by a slight dip in the helicopter's angle. He saw the glowing sign that topped the towering headquarters of Wayne Enterprises. "'Isn't it incredible?' Edward Nigma said for what seemed the three hundredth time that day, leaning out of his cubicle and addressing a passing co-worker. "'Bruce Wayne, here!' Edward would certainly know him when he saw him, for on the opposite wall of his cubicle was something that could only be considered a shrine to Bruce Wayne. There was an assortment of photographs, articles, magazine covers... Nigma had it all planned out. He'd meet Bruce Wayne face to face. He knew exactly what Bruce would say. He'd been rehearsing it for weeks upon months. Someone else was walking past now. Fred Stickley, who wore his state of harassment with as much familiarity as other people wore backward baseball caps. Edward was on his feet immediately. Mr. Stickley, he called. When are you uh, planning to bring my project to Mr. Wayne? His adult face still had the zeal that had been present ever since he'd come out of the coma he'd been in when he was younger for three weeks after he'd cracked his head on the curbside. The coma he'd come to think of as his cocoon time before emerging into the world with a clear and unfettered vision. His greatest frustration was that there were so many people out there who didn't share his vision. Fred Stickley was one of them. Mr. Nigma, Stickley snapped. What part of no were you unable to grasp? He tried to sound pleasant. <laughs> you do outstanding work on the projects you've been given, but the stuff you're developing on your own, it's... Over the top? Pushing the envelope? Out there? Stickley had been going to simply say crazy, but instead he nodded amenably. All those. Nigma's mouth drew into a smile that didn't touch his eyes. Well he whispered. Why don't we let Mr. Wayne decide that for himself? The great doors of Bruce Wayne's office swung inward and Bruce Wayne emerged, followed by his secretary Margaret, his CEO, and a bevy of aides that seemed to have sprung up like mushrooms. Margaret, reading off a clipboard, said, The president called. You left your tennis racket at the White House. He wanted to assure you that the arms ban will stay on the bill. Wayne had taken a stack of contracts from one of the aides and was signing them quickly, moving through them like a thresher through wheat. Apparently oblivious of any distractions, Margaret continued, A gossip Gertie from Good Morning Gotham, again, must know who you're taking to the charity circus. Other aides chimed in, 
The Circus Benefits Committee would like you to make a speech. The painting you saw in the catalog, sir, the price is two million. Please, sir, the stocks... Wayne pointed virtually at random to assorted aides and said, No speeches. Buy. Sell. He paused a moment, hoped that he hadn't just snapped out orders that would send him spiraling into bankruptcy, and then turned to his CEO and said, Let's start the inspection. In his cubicle, Edward Nigma heard the group heading his way. My God, it's him, he whispered. Without hesitation, he darted out into the hallway, just as the group was approaching from the other direction. Edward thrust himself squarely in their path. He seized Wayne's hand in a vise-like grip and started pumping it firmly. Wayne was politely puzzled as he asked, Mr... Nigma, Edward, Edward Nigma. He still hadn't let go of Bruce's hand. Bruce said gamely, Ah, uh, I'm going to need that hand back, Ed. Ah, uh, yes, of course. I'm sorry. It's just that... He took a deep breath and plunged in. You're my idol, and some people have been trying to keep us apart. Stickley had gone dead white. He looked as if he were going to have a cerebral hemorrhage. So, Mr. Enigma, what's on your mind? Precisely, declared Edward, launching into a spiel that he had been preparing for two months every day, every night. What's on all our minds? Brain waves. The future of Wayne Enterprises is brain waves. Wayne was staring at him. At him, and then back to Stickley. I really do apologize, Mr. Wayne, said Stickley. I personally terminated his project this morning. Grasping Wayne by the elbow, Edward pulled him over to his cubicle. He gestured towards the device that covered his desktop. There was a small TV monitor rigged to transceivers, diodes, and tangled wires. Voila, declared Edward. He spoke all in a rush. My invention beams any TV signal directly into the human brain by stimulating neurons, manipulating brain waves, if you will. This device creates a fully holographic image that puts the audience inside the show. My remote encephalographic stimulator box will give John Q. Public a realm where he is king. He fired Stickley a venomous glance and turned back to Wayne. I just need a bit of additional funding for human trials. Let me show you. Bruce's mouth began to move and Edward held his breath, waiting. Suddenly it seemed as if Bruce's attention had been drawn away. He blinked, then refocused on Edward. Listen, Ed, uh, let me see your technical schematics on this. Bruce's glance darted away once more, and then he said, Call my assistant Margaret. She'll set something up. Edward felt his world coming unglued. Anyone could be told to call Bruce's secretary. Anyone! He was not even remotely able to keep the agony from his voice as he said, Oh, call your secretary? Is that it? Yes, we'll get together. Bruce started to move away, and Edward caught the satisfied, even vindictive gleam in Stickley's face. He grabbed Bruce's arms and shouted, No! Don't leave me! My invention! I need you! Bruce was thunderstruck as he was pulled partway into Edward's office, and then he caught sight of the shrine. Wayne's gaze zeroed in on the picture of himself as a young man. Edward could feel the temperature in the cubicle drop to sub-zero. Tampering with people's brain waves is mind manipulation. It raises too many questions, Wayne said, when he gently dislodged Edward's fingers from round his arm. Nigma made no effort to hold on. And as he stared after the retreating form of Bruce Wayne, he muttered, You were supposed to understand. You were supposed to understand. And then in a voice very low and very dangerous, he said, I'll make you understand. He stepped back into his cubicle and never noticed what Bruce Wayne had suddenly caught sight of in the midst of Edward's presentation. It was a signal projected against a low-hanging cloud, a signal that was the emblem of a bat. Wayne strode into his private office, having given firm orders that he was not to be disturbed. Just to play it safe, Bruce said briskly, Lock! An electronic lock slammed into place. He plopped down into the leather chair and spoke again. Capsule! And the chair dropped out of sight. The floor under him slid back to reveal a hidden transport tunnel, the capsule rolled forward and then angled sharply downward as it eased into the shaft. 
It built up speed, hurtling down the shaft, holding tightly onto the tracks, and then snapped forward to a normal angle and hurtled underground to a pre-encoded destination. Alfred was waiting patiently nearby in the large vault that Bruce Wayne had entered mere moments before. Wayne emerged from the vault, his long black cape sweeping around him, his gauntleted arms folded across his sculpted chest, his eyes glimmered from beneath his cowl. He moved quickly to the long, powerful black car. Moments later, the Batmobile roared forward. It whipped through a holograph of trees that masked the entrance to the Batcave. It screeched out onto the forest road, fallen leaves and dead branches whipping around as the powerful vehicle blew past. The guard's name was Tully. Once he'd been a cop, he'd walked the streets of Gotham City for 27 years, and after those glorious 27 years, he'd taken a job at the Second National Bank of Gotham as a security guard. And now, on the 22nd floor of the bank's office building, Tully was tied up on the ground, bound at his wrists and ankles. Standing around him were six thugs of varying sizes and shapes. Tully was trying not to look at them. Instead, he was staring out the window at the great signal hanging in the sky, a bat illuminated against a low-hanging cloud. And then the signal was blocked out by the twirling disk of a gleaming silver coin. A hand speared out and snagged it easily, and a man stepped into view. Once upon a time, he'd gone by the name of Harvey Dent. That was no longer sufficient. He had needed a moniker that captured his duality. "'Counting on the winged adventure to deliver you from evil, old chum?' asked Two-Face. He clutched the coin more tightly. "'We most certainly are.' Tully tried to keep his voice level as he asked. "'You're gonna kill me?' Two-Face held the silver dollar under Tully's nose. The clean side winked at him. "'Maybe, and maybe not. You could say we're of two minds on the matter.' Are you a gambling man? Suppose we flip for it. Life or dare I say. He turned the coin over, and there was the scarred face of the coin. Death. Death, he repeated, and he flipped the coin. It twirled in the air and landed directly in front of the guard's face. Tully didn't see what came up, and to prolong the agony, Two-Face brought his foot down quickly on top of it. He put up a finger, waggling it slightly. Wait, wait, wait. How will justice be served? He removed his foot from the coin, and the guard forced himself to look at it. The unblemished head looked back at him. Fortune smiles on you, my friend, Two-Face said gently. Another day of wine and roses, or in your case, beer and pizza. The guard sobbed with relief and hated himself for the weakness. Two-Face snapped his fingers twice. The thugs converged on the guard. One lifted him up by his bound arms, another by his legs. You, you said you'd let me live. Too true, and so you shall. Nothing better than live bait to trap a bat. How do you know he'll be here? asked Chase Meridian. Commissioner James Gordon, wishing like hell his bad heart hadn't forced him to give up smoking, chewed on a breadstick as he surveyed the heavens. The bat signal continued unblinking. He will be. You don't know for sure, pressed Dr. Meridian. Being bigger than life doesn't guarantee a spectacular or heroic death. Look at Lawrence of Arabia. Gordon swiveled his gaze towards her. Is there some point to this, doctor? I'm wondering why you have such unflappable confidence in him. Is it the cape? The mask? That emblem? He pointed towards the bat signal, which was suddenly blocked out by a swinging figure. That's why, he said. Batman dropped down face to face with Dr. Chase Meridian. Hot entrance. She heard a voice that sounded remarkably like her own, passing through her lips. For his part, Batman seemed to have lost interest in her. All business, he turned to Gordon. Two-Face? Gordon nodded. Two guards down, he's holding the third hostage. Didn't see this one coming. We should have, though, said Chase. The second bank of Gotham... On the second anniversary of the day I captured him, said Batman. It was hard to tell whether he'd figured it out on the way over, or had just realized it now. Chase pushed gamely forward. 
How could Two-Faced resist? Ah, ah, Chase Meridian, she prompted when Batman didn't shake her outstretched hand. He still didn't, instead merely staring at her as if she were some new strain of bacteria or perhaps a rare animal who'd popped up at a zoo one day. Gordon piped up, sounding slightly regretful. I, um... Uh, Asked Dr. Meridian to consult on this case. She uh, specializes in multiple personalities. Batman interrupted. Abnormal psychology. I read your work. Insightful. He paused, then added, Naive, but insightful. I'm flattered. Not every girl makes a superhero's night table. Gordon asked, Can we reason with him? There are innocent people in there. Chase shook her head. Won't do any good. He'll slaughter them without thinking twice. Agreed, said Batman. A trauma powerful enough to create an alternate personality leaves the victim. In a world where normal rules of right and wrong no longer apply, Chase picked up. Exactly, said Batman. Like you. Batman looked at her inscrutably. It was impossible for her to be sure, but it seemed, just for a moment, as if there was the slightest hint of a smile on his mouth. Chase said, Let's just say I could write a hell of a paper on a grown man who dresses like a flying rodent. Bats aren't rodents, Dr. Meridian. Same phylum, chordata. Same class, mammalia. Different order, though. Chiroptera, not rodentia. No sharp front teeth for gnawing. She inclined her head slightly at the correction. I didn't know that, see? You are interesting. And call me Chase. She turned to look at a bustling group of SWAT members. By the way, do you have a first name, or do I just call you Bats? She looked back to see his reaction. But he was gone. That was when she heard the crash. A crash that sounded as if the world were exploding. The building shuddered under the impact, but Two-Face seemed unperturbed. From outside, there was a grinding of motors, the whoosh of air, and this time, when the wrecking ball struck the building, it didn't merely quiver. Instead, the wall exploded inward. From the elevator nearby, there was the amazingly ordinary sound of a chime, indicating that one of the cars had reached the floor. Two-Face nodded approvingly. Punctual, even for his own funeral. He whirled towards the elevators, his gang members leaping forward with machine guns under their arms. One of them tossed a gun to Two-Face, who caught it easily and aimed at the elevator doors. They fired until the clips were empty, and then Two-Face put up a hand, indicating that they should move forward to see the results of their assault. They walked cautiously towards the elevators, slamming new clips into the weapons as they went. The doors slid open. The shaft was empty. Two-Face gaped in confusion. He barely had time to wonder how in God's name Batman had managed to override the controls, because the next thing he knew, he was under attack. Batman swung down from the middle shaft feet first, plowing into the thugs and sending them scattering. He landed cleanly, his hand on his utility belt. He pulled two weapons, gripping one in either hand. In the right was a small projectile launcher. He squeezed the trigger, and a pellet shot through the air, smacking onto the floor squarely in front of the two thugs. It was a thick super-adhesive. It soaked into their shoes and into the skin of their feet. They'd been brought to a dead halt. In Batman's left hand, meantime, was a bola. It snaked out and wrapped itself around the upper torso of a third thug who went down. A fourth thug was charging. Batman slugged him once in the stomach, doubling him over, and then twice more in the head. A defiant howl of rage alerted Batman as another thug charged down the hall. He had two lethal spike-covered gloves, and he was barreling towards Batman, waving them viciously. The gloved felon came at him, lunging towards him and bolstering his own confidence with his banshee-like screams. He thrust his deadly appendages at Batman, who ducked under the charge. Overbalanced, the thug tripped over Batman's crouched form and fell down the elevator shaft. Batman nodded to himself as he heard a thud from below. The elevator car wasn't all that far, so there was every chance that the thug had only sustained minor injuries. Then he turned just in time to see Two-Face disappearing down a hallway. Without hesitation, he gave chase. Tully sat in the sizable vault area, rocking back and forth in hopes of somehow tipping the chair over, perhaps breaking it, and in that way managing to free his bound arms and legs. His gagged mouth was aching from the tape that was across it. 
He heard footsteps and braced himself for the likelihood that Two-Face was coming back to kill him, or perhaps instead to play that demented coin-tossing game of his again. Instead, a caped figure stepped into the narrow entranceway to the vault. Tully's eyes went wide. It was him. Damn it! It was him! Except it couldn't be him. It mustn't. Tully made frantic noises in his throat, trying in some way to warn him off. But Batman moved quickly to Tully, freed his hands, and tore the tape off his mouth. Pain roared through Tully's face, but that didn't stop him from getting out the words, It's a trap! It was a useful, if somewhat tardy, sentence. The safe door slammed shut before Batman could even turn. Before the resounding clang of the heavy metal barrier had even begun to fade, Two-Face's voice issued from a speaker hidden somewhere within the vault. "'Good evening, Mr. Bat,' he said in a grave imitation of an old television series. "'Your mission, should you choose to accept it or not, is simple. Die!' Batman and Tully were hurled to the floor as the safe jerked forward, starting to move. There was the sound of chains outside, dragging across the floor. "'We have a problem,' said Batman. By the time Gordon's people had gotten to the huge crane that had operated the wrecking ball, all they found was an empty cab. The monstrous machine had done its work, and the operators, more of Two-Face's people, no doubt, had fled. Gordon banged a car hood in frustration, feeling helpless. Then he heard something. It was the unmistakable sound of whirling helicopter blades. He looked up towards the twenty-second floor and moved from helplessness to utter shock. A Black Hawk helicopter had moved into position, a giant winch dangling beneath it. It seemed to be drawing something through the huge hole that the wrecking ball had pounded in the side of the building. After a moment, Gordon was able to make out what it was. It was the safe from within the bank, dangling hundreds of feet above the ground and being drawn slowly up into the helicopter's cargo hold. Gordon swore under his breath. I just hope to God that Batman and the hostage are safe. Inside the safe, Batman was able to figure out, from the swaying of the vault and the pounding of the whirling blades outside, just exactly what the situation was. "'Why does he want to kill you?' asked Tully apprehensively. "'I was his friend,' replied Batman, scanning the interior of the vault in the hopes of finding a way out. "'Do all your friends want to kill you?' "'Only the ones who get to know me.' What Batman had spotted, which he didn't like one bit, were small spigots on the wall. What the hell did they have to do with anything? Once again, Two-Face's voice came through the hidden speakers. Two years ago tonight you abandoned us to that madhouse. So, happy anniversary! And for your dying pleasure, we're serving the very same acid that made yours truly the men we are today. The purpose of the spigots was quickly made clear. Acid, with a reddish color that had long seared itself into Batman's memory, started pouring out of them. Wherever the acid struck, there was a loud hissing and rising smoke. The acid wasn't strong enough to eat through steel, so the money, safely ensconced in steel drawers, would be unharmed. But Batman and Tully weren't in quite as fortunate a position. When we open this safe crowed Two-Face. We'll have all we ever wanted, enough cash to open a mint, and you dead. Batman steepled his legs, feet pressing on opposite sides of the wall in front of the safe door. It gave him some elevation, but not much. Acid started to burn at his cape. He looked around, fighting down desperation, and suddenly his eyes lit on something useful. I need to borrow this, he said, and grabbed the guard's hearing aid. Holding it to the door, he used it to augment his own hearing and started working the combination. He focused his concentration, not rushing his way through the soft clicks of the tumblers. Once we were allies, bound by a passion to fight evil, Two-Face told him. The guard from his precarious perch wiped the sweat from his face. He accidentally knocked off his glasses. They fell into the rising acid and turned molten in no time. Know what I've learned, bat old pal? passion burns. And as the acid started pumping in faster, he called out in demented joy, Burn, Batty, burn! The final tumbler clicked into place. Batman threw open the door, grabbing the door jam in one hand, the guard in the other, and swung out onto the safe's top, just as the floor of hissing acid streamed past below his feet. Then he pulled out his wire poon and fired it into the bank wall. 
The hook embedded solidly, and Batman quickly attached the trailing end of the cable to the safe with another hook, snapping it into place. He wasn't sure how heavy the safe was. He suspected the cable was sufficient. With his free hand, he reached up and grabbed the chain that was suspending the safe. Hang on. What? shouted the guard. Batman gripped the chain, and using the torch, sliced at the links just below his hand. The safe swung down and away, the cable line drawing taut. In a perfect arc, the safe swung back through the hole from which it had emerged mere moments ago. It slid across the floor, skidding with the sound of screeching metal, and slammed into the far wall. Batman, in the meantime, was clambering up the chain toward the open cargo hatch. The yank upwards had been so quick, so violent, that it had knocked the blowtorch out of his hand. But he was going to rein in Harvey Dent, and nothing was going to stop him. From within the cockpit, Two-Face stared down in pure fury. The pilot started to ask what it was that Two-Face wanted him to do, when Two-Face grabbed the controls away from him, yanked back on the throttle, and sent the chopper shooting straight up into the night sky like a rocket. The helicopter angled towards Gotham Harbor, where a giant sign read, Welcome to Gotham City. Two-Face gunned the chopper's engines and angled toward the sign. He ignored the pilot's cries of terror that he was coming in too low. Two-Face sent the helicopter roaring downward, the lower half and trailing chain smashing through the sign, ripping it to shreds. As if he'd totally forgotten about piloting the chopper, Two-Face moved away from the controls so that he could better see out the side. The pilot quickly grabbed control of the chopper as Two-Face made his way over to the cargo hatch. He peered down at the chain and saw exactly what he thought he'd see. Nothing. Goodbye to that pointy-eared, steroid-eating, rubber-suited, cross-dressing night-rat! Then a shadow suddenly cast itself over him. The only source of light was through the windshield, and with a berserk yell, Two-Face spun. Sure enough, covering the plexiglass windshield was a familiar black cape. Two-Face yanked out his guns and started firing. Bullets went everywhere, through the windshield, through the cape, and, unfortunately, through the pilot. The pilot slumped forward on the stick, sending the chopper into a dive. Two-Face was hurled forward. He smashed into the windshield, which was already riddled with bullet holes. It cracked further under the impact, and Two-Face scrambled back so that he wouldn't crash completely through it and be hurled down to the icy water below. He grabbed the pilot's corpse, wrested it from its position, and tossed it aside. Then he clambered into the vacated seat and regained control of the spiraling chopper. That was when a fist smashed through the side window, tagging Two-Face squarely on the jaw. His head snapped back, crashing into the cushioned wall behind him. Crouched on one of the struts on the outside of the speeding helicopter, Batman hung on with single-minded determination. Harvey, you need help. Give it up. Suddenly Harvey brought his feet up, slamming them squarely into Batman's face. Mano a mano a battle, called Two-Face as Batman lost his grip, sliding and having to grab onto the lower half of the strut. Batman took a breath, then hauled himself back up, ripping apart the last remains of the side door that were acting as a barrier to him. He grabbed Two-Face's foot, flipped him to the floor, and started dragging him out of the helicopter. Two-Face struggled back furiously. I've spent two years in Arkham Asylum planning your demise, Two-Face called. There's only one way out of this waltz. One of us dies! I won't kill you, Harvey. But Batman's actions were contradicting his words. His fingers found Two-Face's throat and clamped down, adrenaline pumping, instinct pushing him. Batman doesn't kill, said Harvey. What's that homicidal gleam in your eye, that lethal curl of your lip? Oh, too good to be true, a bat with a taste for blood. We're just the same, he said. You're a killer, too. For a moment, Batman's concentration was thrown. A second later, so was Batman, as he vanished from sight beneath the chopper. Harvey yanked himself back into the chopper and looked at the course in front of him. There was the Lady Gotham statue, recently refurbished, standing proudly in the harbor. Two-Face smiled as it all came together. Hello, my lovely. Ready for your facelift? He reached under the seat and pulled out a large iron brace he used to lock the controls into place, fixing the helicopter on its deadly course. Let the world be made new in our split image. Clutching onto the underside support strut, Batman hauled himself up once more toward the open side of the helicopter. With a thrust of his powerful legs, he shoved himself into the cockpit. No sign of Harvey. What he did see were two things, the iron bar holding the chopper steady, and Harvey Dent poised over the cargo hatch. 
It was as if he'd been waiting for Batman to show up. This time, have the good taste to die, Dent requested in a rather formal tone, and he leaped through the cargo hatch. Batman moved quickly to the cargo hatch and stared in stunned disbelief as Harvey Dent plummeted towards the dark water below. There was a sudden flurry of expanding color caught in Lady Gotham's lighthouse beam, and a parachute opened over Two-Face. And then the helicopter smashed into the left side of Lady Gotham's face. Batman was hurled through the cargo hatch as the Black Hawk erupted in a massive fireball, consuming part of the statue's visage and transforming it, in a matter of seconds, into a damaged, ugly parody of itself. Batman had just enough time to curve his body into a diving form, and then he split the water. He vanished beneath the water's surface, and to any onlooker, had there been any, it would have seemed impossible that Batman would be resurfacing. But he broke the surface, gasping for air, arms and legs moving desperately, trying to keep himself above water. Within moments he'd steadied himself enough, and then he trod water and looked up at the ungodly illumination high above him. Half of Lady Gotham's once beautiful face was still flaming, a blazing mockery of all of Batman's efforts. Then he began the long, unpleasant swim to shore, as the burning Lady Gotham lit the way. Someone was working late at Wayne Enterprises. Edward Nigma was hunched over his device, working at a fever pitch. Then an officious voice sounding like a cross between a foghorn and a Rottweiler snapped from the entrance to his cubicle. What the hell is going on here? Edward looked up at Stickley, his eyes not even fully focusing on him. I told you your project is terminated. Nigma gave no response, but that was okay with Stickley. He wasn't looking for any. Instead, he smiled nastily. For that matter, I'm cancelling you, Nigma. You deliberately disobeyed me. That was insubordination. But not only that, you roughed up Bruce Wayne and subjected him to your fixation. That was just plain stupid. He waited for a reaction, but all he saw was the fevered intensity of Edward Nigma's gaze centered on him. He turned away gruffly and said, I'm calling security. He got two feet before Edward brought the coffee pot crashing down on his head. Stickley went down without a sound. When Stickley awoke, he wasn't sure where he was at first. He was strapped to a rolling swivel chair. Then he became aware that there was something balanced on his head. He nodded back and forth, trying to shake it off. It felt like a hat, or... There were wires trailing from whatever it was to a machine of some sort, and now enough of his confusion fell away so that he was able to perceive Edward Nigma wearing a similar rig on his own head, making what seemed to be final adjustments. Nigma must have somehow sensed that Stickley had come too, because he said, "'This won't hurt a bit.' Then he gave the matter a moment's thought, and added, "'At least I don't think it will.' Stickley bellowed, "'Nigma, you press that button and—' "'And what? I'm fired?' He flipped a switch. The TV screen flared to life, and hovering there in the glow was a holographic representation of Stickley reeling in a prize bass. Then the figures began to waver and tremble. "'Losing resolution,' muttered Edward to himself. "'More power!' He threw a second switch, and immediately warning lights flared to life. A white beam lanced out from the TV into Stickley's headband. One look at Stickley's glazed, slack expression made it quite clear that he was not aware of anything at all. But Nigma looked invigorated, even reborn. The normal glimmer of twisted genius had been accelerated by somewhere around a factor of one hundred. It was as if his brain had been blown in an infinite number of directions all at once and was now hurriedly reassembling itself. And from that reassembly came different impulses, different thoughts, a scattergun of personalities and notions, people that Nigma and or Stickley had met or hated or loved or had made any impression on him at all, all of them bubbling to the surface, struggling for their moment, fighting for dominance. Sounding much like the host of a game show, Edward barked, Ed Nigma, come on down. You're the next contestant on Brain Drain. I'll take what's inside thick skull number one. 
Then Edward's own personality, what there was of it at any rate, came roaring back to the surface. Stickly, I've had a breakthrough. And a breakdown? Maybe. Nevertheless, I'm smarter. I'm a genius. No, <laughs> several geniuses. A flock of freaking Freuds. Riddle me this, Fred. What is everything to someone and nothing to everyone else? <laughs> Your mind, of course. And now mine pumps with the power of yours. With what little control he had left, Nigma reached over and shut off the machine. The light flickered and died, and with a sigh, as if having just physically separated from a lover, Nigma muttered, What a rush! Then Stickley spoke. The reason this was so interesting to Edward was that he had no clue that Stickley would be able to speak, or think, or make himself understood after the treatment. So being subjected to this device wasn't terminal. What, what the hell just happened? Nigma smiled gleefully. While you were mesmerized by my 3D TV, I utilized your neural energy to grow smarter. Boisterously, he added, I am a Columbus of the mind! Land ho! It took Stickley a few moments to truly comprehend what it was that Nigma was telling him. Nigma had been what? Fluttering around in his brain? Sucking away his neural energy? It was like some sort of mind rape. Making no attempt to restrain his fury, Stickley roared, Bruce Wayne was right, you demented, bizarre, unethical toad. It is mind manipulation. I'm reporting you to the FCC, the Human Experimentation Board, the AMA, the police, the federal government. But first and foremost, Nigma, you are fired. Do you hear me? Fired! Cackling with demented glee, Nigma shot back, <laughs> I don't think so. He lashed out with a foot, kicking the chair to which Stickley had been tied. The chair rolled back across the slick floor at high speed, Stickley yelling obscenities and totally unaware of his jeopardy until he smashed through the large round window at the end of the corridor. Stickley shrieked and stopped short. The chair was teetering on the edge. Only one thing kept him from tumbling off the precipice, and that was the long wire attached to his headband. Edward Nigma charged up to him. Then he leaned in close, gripping the wire headband. With a sneer of contempt, he said, Fred, babe, you're fired. Or should I say, terminated? He yanked the headband off Stickley, and his former boss's only means of support was gone. He barely had time to utter a screech before the chair tilted backwards and plummeted to the ground far below. Edward didn't even bother to hang around to see the landing. By the time Stickley hit, Nigma was already back at his cubicle, staring intensely at the photos of Bruce Wayne all over the interior of his cubicle. Questions, Mr. Wayne. My work raises too many questions. With mind-blinding fury, he started ripping the pictures down from the walls. Why should you have it all and not me? Edward Nigma leaned against the outside of his cubicle, sobbing profusely onto the shoulder of the head of personnel. She was patting him awkwardly, not quite sure what to make of this display of grief. <laughs> why? Oh, why? He moaned inconsolably. I can't believe it. Two years working in the same office and then this. This was a note that Nigma was thrusting into the confused woman's hands. I found it in my cubicle. You'll find handwriting and sentence structure matches exactly. I, I couldn't possibly continue here. The memories. I'll get my things. He ducked quickly into his cubicle, where he'd already boxed up his invention. Outside he heard voices. One of them was Bruce Wayne's. Another was older, gruff, sounded extremely cop-like. He took one final glance around as if to imprint on his mind a final image of what he was leaving behind. That way he could carry it with him mentally as he progressed towards a greater and far more glorious future. 
and he took the opportunity to bolt out a side door, so that by the time Bruce Wayne and Commissioner Gordon walked past, he was barreling down the steps of the emergency stairway. Wayne and Gordon stood in front of the security console, studying the tape from the previous night. Stickley was clearly visible, writing a note which they could safely assume was the suicide note that had been turned in to the head of personnel. Upon finishing, Stickley lay the note down carefully. Then he took a chair, gripped it firmly, and, using it as a battering ram, charged towards the large window at the end of the corridor. He smashed through it, clutching the chair and vanishing from sight. "'That all jibes,' said Gordon. "'Both your man and the chair shattered to—' He paused. "'Sorry, Bruce, I uh, didn't mean to upset you.' Bruce nodded in acknowledgment. In any event, this looks pretty cut and dry. Definitely suicide. Thanks for the help, Bruce. We'll be in touch. Bruce shook hands briskly and then turned away from Gordon. He paused momentarily at Edward Nigma's cubicle, thinking about the intensity in the man's eyes the other day. The cubicle was fairly empty. Nigma's personal items and that odd-looking device of his were gone. Bruce stared at the vacant cubicle for a time, and then he headed to his office. Margaret followed him, scribbling furiously. She said, "'Gossip Gertie and the Society columnists have called a record thirty-two times. I think if they don't know soon who you plan to take to the charity circus, the world is surely going to end.' Bruce was about to answer when he noticed something on his desk. It was an envelope. "'What's this?' He flipped it over and scrutinized it. "'No postmark, no stamp.' He pulled it open and read, if you look at the numbers upon my face, you won't find thirteen any place. He turned the paper over, but there was no signature. It's a riddle. Numbers upon my face. One through twelve. No thirteen. He shrugged at the obviousness of it. A clock. Margaret scratched her head. Who would send you riddles? He turned to her and said, Maggie. That's the riddle. Edward Nigma was at work in his cluttered apartment in a run-down tenement building. He was putting the finishing touches to his second riddle. Guess what, Bruce Wayne, he muttered. Now I'm the guy with all the answers. He turned and looked lovingly at his modified brain scan equipment. The box. It sparkled and sputtered slightly, running self-tests and diagnostics. It was almost ready. Almost ready. He rose and went to the window, resting a hand gently on the box's gleaming surface. He looked out over the ugliness of his neighborhood, toward the gleaming spires of the uptown sections of Gotham, and beyond that, up in the hills, the residence where Bruce Wayne sat on high like great Zeus, looking down at the puny mortals and rendering judgments. This person shall be raised up, this other one cast down. Edward Nigma was going to take it away from him. There are seven million brains in the naked city, and they'll all be mine. When Alfred did not find Bruce in his bedroom, he descended to the bat cave to check, and there he was, Seated in a high back chair, his fingers were steepled, and he was staring off into space. "'Can I get you anything, sir?' he asked finally. "'Yes,' Bruce nodded slowly. "'You can get me an appointment with Dr. Meridian.' "'Very good, sir.' By the time he'd gotten upstairs, however, Alfred had brought in the mail and discovered the second riddle— which meant that all of a sudden Bruce Wayne's reason for going to see Dr. Meridian had changed. Dr. Meridian was a fairly new arrival to Gotham City, and Gordon had rather graciously afforded her office space at the police complex. In return, she made herself available several days a week to consult with Gordon and other police officers on various investigations. Knowing what a major supporter of the police the Wayne Foundation had always been, she had agreed to make time for Bruce Wayne. Well, how can I help you, Mr. Wayne? He reached into his vest pocket and pulled out two pieces of paper, tossing them onto her desk. Somebody's been sending me love letters, one at my office, one at home. Commissioner Gordon thought you might give me your expert opinion. She read them both quickly. A clock, she said, deciphering the first one almost as quickly as Wayne had. 
But this second one, tear one off and scratch my head, what once was red is black instead? She shrugged. A newspaper? No, that's black and white and red all over. He indicated the riddle. The answer to this is a match. She nodded absently and continued to study the riddles. Letters were trimmed out of newspaper and magazine headlines, and, most disturbing, a border composed of dripping daggers. She held up one letter in either hand. My opinion? This letter writer is a total wacko. Wacko? He seemed amused. <laughs> is that a technical term? A patient may suffer from obsessional syndrome with potential homicidal inclinations. Work better for you? So what you're saying is that this guy's a total wacko, right? She smiled slightly. Exactly. I guess someone like you encounters more than his share of nutcases, eh? He looked at her levelly. You'd be amazed. Then he saw over her head a framed print of a bat on the wall. He pointed at it and said, You have a thing for bats? She said, That's a Rorschach, Mr. Wayne, an ink blot. People see what they want. Bruce didn't get any further than a simple, Oh. Because when he looked back at the print, he saw that it was indeed a Rorschach ink blot. Dr. Meridian watched Bruce Wayne's face carefully as he stared at the ink blot. With a raised eyebrow, she asked, I think the question would be, do you have a thing for bats? It was an inquiry that he clearly had no interest in answering, and every interest in avoiding. He reached over and tapped the papers. So, uh, this Riddler, for want of a better name, is dangerous? She pursed her lips in thought, letting the topic drift. What do you know about obsession? A little, he said. Obsessions are born of fear, said Dr. Meridian. Recall a moment of great terror. Say you associate that moment with, uh, say, a bat. Over time, the bat's image penetrates the mind, invades every aspect of your daily life. Can you imagine something like that? It's a stretch, but I'll manage. Dr. Meridian said, The letter writer is obsessed with you. His only escape may be to... To purge the fixation. To kill me. Huh? You understand obsession better than you let on. He nodded slightly as he picked up a small wicker totem doll from the table. Still play with dolls, Doctor? She's a Malaysian dream, Warden. Some cultures believe she stands sentry while you sleep and guards your dreams. Silly to you, I'm sure. But Bruce's expression stopped her short. Somewhere within her, her little inner psychiatrist cried, Bingo! Pay dirt! You got him! There's something there. Start asking questions. Probe. Find out what's bothering him. She made a thrust forward, a probing question. You're not exactly what you seem, are you, Bruce Wayne? What is it you really came here for? He wanted to answer her. That much she could easily see. But instead he coolly looked at his watch and said, Oops! Time's up! Ah, that's usually my line. Look, I'd love to keep chatting. Would you? Yes, I would. But I'm going to have to get you out of those clothes. She felt lost. <laughs> Excuse me? And into a black dress. Once her confusion was utter bafflement, he said, Tell me, Doctor, do you like the circus? It wasn't a black dress. It was dark maroon, crushed velvet, Still, it had been more than sufficient when Bruce had picked Chase up at her rented townhouse. Bruce was in his tux, and the two of them were inside the Hippodrome, next to the harbor, third row center at the Gotham Charity Circus. From the center ring, the ringmaster was calling, Ladies and gentlemen, seventy feet above the ground, performing feats of aerial skill without a net, the Flying Graysons! The name Grayson immediately rang a bell with Chase, and she looked up at the family of aerialists already embarking on their trapeze act to the accompaniment of pounding drums. There were four of them. It shouldn't be too hard to pick out. She pointed. Some guy was making off with my purse the other day, and that boy, that one there, 
and she pointed as Dick hurtled across the open air into the waiting hands of his father, who was dangling upside down from his knees. He stopped him. His father was with him. Richard and John, those were their names. Richard and John Grayson. The boy was incredibly brave, and now I understand why. Look what he does for a living. Before she could say anything further, they suddenly found themselves with a spotlight shining directly on them. And the ringmaster was announcing, "'Tonight's charity benefit has raised $375,000 for Gotham Children's Hospital. Let's thank our largest single donor, Bruce Wayne.' Bruce shrugged to Chase in a what-are-you-going-to-do manner and stood taking a quick bow before quickly regaining his seat. "'And now,' continued the ringmaster, "'Richard, the youngest flying Grayson, will perform the awe-inspiring death drop.' Chase watched raptly, as did Bruce. Dick Grayson stood on the highest platform. Grabbing the trapeze bar, he swung out high into the air above the crowd. And then, as he soared above the center of the arena, Dick released the trapeze. He fell, somersaulting in mid-air, over and over again. The crowd was a blur around him, and then suddenly his downward plunge was halted by a pair of strong hands that he knew, beyond question, would always be there for him. "'Fly, Robin, fly!' his father intoned to him. They swung toward the platform, then back again toward the center as the acclamation of the crowd below swept over them. Mary Grayson was on the opposite platform and with practiced skill sent the other empty trapeze arcing towards them. John Grayson released his son as Dick twirled in mid-air and snagged the other trapeze. He landed on the platform next to his mother and together they waved down to the crowd. On the opposite side, Chris waved too as he hauled his father in. "'Life doesn't get any better than this, does it, Dad?' Chris said. To which John could only reply, "'Never.' "'Look, I'm rock-climbing Sunday,' Bruce Wayne said to Chase Meridian. "'How about coming along?' "'I'd like to, actually. I love climbing, I really do.' He supplied the next obvious word for her. "'But... I guess I've met someone. Fast work. You just moved here. She gave him a sad look. You know, much to my surprise, you really are terrific, but you could say he kind of dropped out of the sky, and bang, I, I think he felt it too. Oh, my God. Bruce? She seemed concerned. Not again. Not again. This one is fixated on Batman, too. What is it, anyway? The mask? The cape? Bruce? And this time her voice was firm, yanking him out of his reverie. Has anyone ever told you that you can act rather strangely? Not to my face, he said. So, ah, uh, you think he felt it, too? Well, of course he did. Who wouldn't? In the center ring of the circus, a tiny car roared into the middle. Clowns began tumbling out one over the other. As that happened, the Graysons descended on the guy wires. Chase smiled at the crazed activity. A land of light and shadow where beasts dance and freaks are kings. He was so startled by the comment that he asked her to repeat it. She did, puzzled, word for word. It's a description of the circus, from a fairy tale my mother used to read. That was all he needed to hear. He took her quickly by the hand and said, We've got to get out of here, now. Suddenly the voice of the ringmaster pulled his full attention back to the center ring. Ladies and gentlemen, please forget all good American wholesome fun, the ringmaster called out, his face obscured by a hanging barker's mic. Tonight a new act for your amusement. We call it Massacre Under the Big Top. The newly arrived clowns immediately shed their garments, yanking massive guns out of the oversized clown clothes. Some people in the crowd were still laughing uncertainly, until a couple of the thugs fired random shots into the air. The unmistakable chatter of the machine guns was the confirmation, for any who still needed it, that the evening had taken a deadly turn. There was panic and screaming, and the ringmaster stepped out from behind the microphone. His hideous split face was now apparent for all to see. People, people, show some grace under pressure. A little decorum, please, cautioned Two-Face, and then added, Shut up or die. 
A couple of thugs rolled a round object into the ring. They attached the sphere to ropes hanging from the rafters. Inside that harmless-looking orb, continued Two-Face, are two hundred sticks of TNT. In our hand, a radio detonator. Calmly, he pushed a button on the box. The bomb promptly beeped in response, and continued to do so one beep per second. You have two minutes, he informed them, with no more concern in his voice than if he had been hawking red hots. An angry voice spoke up from the crowd. What the hell do you want? Bruce turned to see the origin of the speaker. It was the mayor. Want, Mr. Mayor? Two-Face called. Just one little thing. Batman. Bruised, broken, bleeding. In a word, dead. One of you must know who Batman is. Unless the bat is surrendered to us post-haste, we're off on a proverbial killing spree. You have two... And then he nodded towards the bomb. Well, just under two minutes. Wayne rose to his feet, for no secret, not even his, was worth innocent lives. Chase, not understanding what he was about to do, tried to pull him back down. That was when people started to shout and point. He looked up towards the rafters and gaped. The flying Graysons were scaling the scaffolding, heading for the bomb. "'Boys, move, move, move!' bellowed Two-Face, furious. Several thugs started climbing guy wires. Chris prodded Dick upward. "'Go! We'll hold them off!' In a daring display that made his earlier theatrics tame in comparison, Dick launched himself from trapeze to trapeze, bounced off the high wire, and just managed to snag an overhead catwalk. He hoisted himself up onto the catwalk. One of the thugs grabbed John's leg. John Grayson kicked him away and jumped to another trapeze. Momentarily distracted by her husband's danger, Mary Grayson was unaware of her own. From underneath the platform she was crouched on, one of two faces thugs swung up and slammed into her. Mary Grayson tried desperately to regain her balance, but then gravity seized her and pulled her downward. As one, the audience screamed. At the last instant, Mary snagged a wildly swinging trapeze with her leg. She hung precariously high above the ground. Dick was clamoring towards the bomb and was able to see the time clock. It ticked down to forty-three, and he had the sick feeling that it didn't signify minutes. The thugs, not having signed on for a suicide mission, started sliding down the ropes and guy wires to put distance between themselves and the bomb. John Grayson, meantime, was moving to help his wife, but he couldn't do it alone. Chris, he shouted, and as if by magic, Chris was there by his side. Quickly, they clambered out onto a trapeze, John anchoring Chris. Just like a thousand times before, Chris, said John calmly. Same old, same old. Not a problem. John set the trapeze swinging, building momentum. Mary saw them coming. She reached out, stretching her fingers so hard that she felt as if they might fall off her hands. The trapeze twisted and tilted under her one leg, and she felt herself slipping off. Dick, meantime, had his own problems, as he worked quickly to unlash the bomb from the rafters. He heard the chatter of machine gun fire and prayed that it wasn't aimed up at him. Then the bomb came free in his hands, and God help him, he almost dropped the damn thing. It bobbled momentarily, but then he recovered it and inadvertently caught a glimpse of the amount of time he had left. Thirteen seconds. Meantime, the thugs were inching back towards the trap door through which they'd made their entrance. The moment the bomb went, so would they. But as the crowd panicked, falling one over the other, it was Bruce Wayne's chance. A sea of people came between him and Chase, and he used the opportunity to slide between the rails. Within seconds he had closed in on one of the guards who blocked the way to Two-Face. Bruce slugged him, and he went down without another sound. Glancing upward, he saw that the daring young man from the flying trapeze had gotten his hands on the bomb and was clambering through a roof hatch. Bruce prayed that the boy, Richard, Chase had said his name was, would be up to it. Then his gaze shifted to the rest of the Graysons high above the ground. The father was swinging the son towards the mother, still twisting between the trapeze and rope, and now they angled back and up towards the trapped woman. The boy's hands closed on his mother's. They had her. It would be a matter of moments for her to disentangle her leg, free herself, and swing safely with her son and husband to the opposite platform. And then Bruce saw Two-Face. Two-Face and one thug between Bruce and the maniac who had turned a charity evening into a hellish disaster. Bruce charged. This thug was holding a machine pistol, however. Bruce dropped to the ground, bullets cutting the air above his head. He rolled and came up, slamming his feet into the thug's face. Bruce grabbed the gun. 
but the thug wasn't inclined to let go. The two of them struggled against each other, angling for position, and that's when Bruce saw the coin glittering in the air. Two-Face had to admire them, a gutsy trapeze family. They had decided to try to be heroes, and they were worthy of the same chance that Two-Face afforded other heroes. Day in, day out, time passes. Fate has her fancies, he intoned, speaking to an audience only he could hear. God stands absent, daydreaming, and the universe asks the same old question. Life? The coin spun in the air and landed at his feet. Or oh, death? He looked down at the scarred head and smiled a twisted smile. Our kind of day, he said. He pulled out his guns and aimed high. Bruce slammed his head into the thug's face. The blow sent him down to the ground, and Bruce grabbed up the machine pistol. He swung the pistol up and aimed it squarely at Two-Face. He had him dead in his sights. Dead. You're a killer, too. And he hurled the machine pistol. It scissored through the air, spinning like a boomerang, and crashed squarely into Two-Face's head but only after Two-Face had squeezed off two shots. The first bullet sliced through one of the trapeze supports that were suspending John and Chris Grayson. The support snapped, and John Grayson skidded off, clutching onto his son's legs. Chris was still holding onto Mary, and he screamed. His mind hadn't fully registered what happened. He only knew that suddenly he felt as if he were being torn in half. Mary shrieked as well. Her frantic hands wrapped around Chris's wrists as he howled, Don't drop me! Don't drop me, Ma! And John knew that he was dead, that he was about to let go of his son's leg and plummet to the ground, because then, maybe, just maybe, Mary could hold on and they would survive. The agony for the three flying Graysons seemed to them an eternity, but it was in fact no longer than it took for Two-Face to squeeze the trigger a second time. The second bullet sliced through the rope supporting Mary Grayson. Dick Grayson scrambled across the roof of the Hippodrome, the bomb ticking under his arm. With a prayer, he hurled the bomb down into the water. Seconds later, there was a muffled explosion, and the water erupted upward about fifty feet, sending a geyser and mist through the air before settling back down. "'I did it,' he whispered in amazement. "'I saved him. This is great! This is great!' He scampered back up the roof, his mind racing. He was going to be a hero. No, not just him. His whole family were going to be heroes. His joy lasted until he regained the catwalk and looked down and saw the broken bodies of his family lying on the ground. Then he heard a loud, piercing, gut-wrenching scream of agony that seemed to go on and on. And somewhere along the way, he realized... It was his own voice. The greatest show on earth, crowed Two-Face a split instant before the machine gun hit him. As he went down, he fired wildly in all directions and unknowingly forcing Bruce Wayne to dive for cover. That was when Bruce heard the shriek, the shriek from on high. He recognized it immediately. It was his own voice. Except it wasn't. It was another voice, but with the same grief and agony that Bruce recalled from himself so many years ago. Bruce and Chase stood outside the Hippodrome, watching the ambulances roll away as more and more police cars seemed to materialize. Bruce felt a certain amount of impatience. What was the purpose of all this? Two-Face was gone, and he was running that moment, the moment, back through his mind. He had sworn not to use guns, a gun was what had cut down his parents, and the very concept of wielding such a weapon was anathema to him. Yet there he had been, holding the machine pistol in his hands, finger curled around the trigger. A quick squeeze, and Two-Face would have been dead. But Bruce's reflexes had kicked in, compelling him to throw the gun instead of firing it. Gently, Chase said to Bruce, Do you want to talk about it? He looked at her and shook his head. Then he saw Dick Grayson from a distance. He had a blanket draped over him, covering his red and green leotards. His head was lowered, his face ashen. He deserved so much better, said Chase. It's so unfair. What happens to him now? asked Bruce. Now? 
He gets pumped into the system, I guess. He thought about the system, the overcrowded, underfinanced system. The hell he does, said Bruce Wayne. It was the next afternoon when the police cruiser pulled up in front of Wayne Manor. Dick Grayson, pack on his back, came riding up behind it on his motorcycle. Then he stared at the house and continued to stare at it. As Bruce Wayne emerged from the house, Commissioner Gordon stepped out at the back of the cruiser. "'It's good of you to take him in,' said Gordon, with no preamble. Dick walked past Gordon, still awestruck by what he was seeing. In the foyer, he looked around in undisguised amazement. From the other direction came Bruce Wayne's trusted butler. "'Welcome, Master Grayson. I'm Alfred.' "'So, how you doing, Al?' Bruce shrugged at the butler and turned to Dick. We prepared a room for you upstairs, but maybe you'd like to eat first. Dick watched out the window until the police cruiser carrying Gordon was safely out of sight. Then he turned to them and said, Okay, I'm out of here. Uh, excuse me, said Bruce. Dick shifted the pack slightly on his back. I figured telling that cop I'd be staying here saved me a truckload of social service interviews and goodwill. So, no offense, but see ya. Thanks. Where will you go? The circus is halfway to Metropolis by now. I'm going to go get a fix on Two-Face, said Dick matter-of-factly. Then I'm going to kill him. Wayne endeavored to take the flat pronouncement in his stride. Killing Two-Face won't take the pain away. In fact, it'll make it worse. Dick looked at him with open skepticism. Look, spare me your sermons, okay? I don't need your advice or your charity. As Dick began to mount his motorcycle, Wayne said serenely, Well, good luck. Then, struck by an afterthought, he said, Oh, you might want to fill up in our garage. No gas station for miles. Dick stared at him for a moment. What the hell? Why not? He rolled the bike toward the garage. The door rolled up to reveal five vintage automobiles. A Rolls, a Bentley, a Spider, and two... Good Lord! Two Turners! Beside them, he saw another array of vintage crafts lined up. Motorcycles, a BMW 950, a Kawasaki Razor, and a Harley Mongoose. Oh, man, was all he was able to get out. I've been looking for someone to restore them, Bruce mused. Too bad you're not staying around. At that moment, Alfred walked into the garage carrying a tray stacked with London broil, baby potatoes, and greens. And it was that precise moment that Dick Grayson knew he was utterly outmatched. Well, maybe I'll stay just a couple of days, said Dick. That evening, the bat signal burned the sky over Gotham City. The Batmobile glided to a halt several blocks away from police headquarters. Batman eased himself out, then stepped away from the vehicle. Shields, he said and heavy-duty shields slammed into place. He walked to the base of the building, pulled out his grappling hook, and fired it skyward. Pressing the retractor, he was hoisted upwards, joining the shadows of the city's sky-high spires. He made his way across the roofs toward the roof of police headquarters. Someone was standing on the other side of the spotlight itself, staring towards the sky. He leaped over to the roof of police headquarters and landed silently. He moved slowly through the shadows, the rooftop had plenty of gravel on it. It made no sound under his feet. He heard a low sigh from the waiting individual and knew it immediately. He said in a slightly ironic tone, Commissioner Gordon? Dr. Chase Meridian turned with a start. Her breath came out in mist through the chill night air. He's at home. I sent the signal. What's wrong? Last night, at the circus... I noticed something about Dent. His coin. He's obsessed with justice. It's his Achilles' heel. It can be exploited. He couldn't believe it. She was telling him nothing new. Hell, she had to know it was nothing new. It was in the case files. He stepped in close to her, his voice rough, his manner intimidating. You called me here for this? The bat signal is not a beeper. She didn't back off. Instead, she took a deep breath and said in a rush, I wish I could say my interest in you was purely professional. 
What is it about the wrong kind of man? She asked wistfully. In grade school, it was guys with earrings, college motorcycles and leather jackets, now black rubber. Try a fireman, Lester take off. I don't mind the work. Pity I can't see behind the mask. He paused. We all wear masks. My life's an open book. You read? He looked at her eyes, at the amusement there. He said, Where do you think this is going to go? Depends. Where are you going to take me? He took her rather ungently by the wrists. Am I just another specimen? Another lab animal for your maze? Or perhaps you thought of bringing me home to meet the folks? In case you haven't noticed, I'm not the kind of guy who blends in at a family picnic. We could give it a try. I'll bring the wine. You bring your scarred psyche. You are direct, aren't you? He squeezed her wrists more tightly. She didn't flinch. You like strong women. I've done my homework. Or do I need skin-tight vinyl and a whip? He wasn't certain how their mouths had drawn as close as they had, but he was suddenly very aware of their proximity and her warm breath against him. I saw the beacon. What's going on? Batman's head snapped around as he saw Commissioner Gordon standing by the roof entrance. Gordon looked from one to the other, puzzlement slowly turning into suspicion. Nothing, Batman told him, turning away from Chase. False alarm. Are you sure? asked Chase. He didn't even glance back at her as he leaped onto the adjoining roof, the shadows welcoming him back within their embrace. The Batmobile streaked along the aqueducts, extending through the cityscape of Gotham. Flared arches supported one roadway over another. And behind one set of arches, Two-Face lay in wait. As the Batmobile shot past, Two-Face spoke into a microphone, alerting the other cars. Gentlemen, start your engines. And two cars roared from side entrances. Each was painted red and black. They moved so quickly that their undercarriages scraped along the asphalt, sending up sparks as the cars tore after the Batmobile. In the Batmobile, an internal warning system began to beep. One or more vehicles had been detected as moving too quickly and too directly towards Batman to be considered mere other traffic. Tactical. Flashing graphics of the Batmobile and the pursuit cars winked into life on the windscreen. Suddenly, two more snapped into the picture as well. Cars pursuing him in a two-by-two -two formation. He cut hard to the left, skittering across two lanes to an off-ramp. And then, in a maneuver that most routine observers would have termed completely insane, the Batmobile veered off and plowed straight through the guardrails. The Batmobile shot through the air, tires spinning, engine roaring. It landed on a rooftop with two distinct thuds. The car roared past chimneys, across the rooftop, so close to one another that it was as easy as driving on the salt flats. With any luck, this getaway would put a quick end to the pursuit. A moment later, he heard the familiar clattering of bullets ricocheting off the Batmobile's armored hide. Batman wasn't particularly concerned about his own welfare. Nothing short of a surface-to-surface -surface missile was going to put a dent in the Batmobile, but the flying bullets might blast through a window somewhere. He didn't need some sleeping three-year-old getting a bullet that had bounced off the impregnable Batmobile. The situation was quickly in danger of becoming moot, however. Directly ahead was a big, fat dead end, the wall of a giant building. From the pursuit cars emerged oddly shaped cannons, which instants later discharged their payload. Massive fireballs blossomed forth like lethal flowers. They roared towards the Batmobile. Within the cockpit, Batman hit a button on the dash. A tiny hood hatch blew off, shooting a bat grapple high into the air. The grapple grabbed the wing of a giant stone gargoyle atop the roof of the building. A powerful hood winch was activated, and the Batmobile was jerked vertical. He drove the powerful car straight up the side of the building. The two foremost cars slammed into the side of the building, arriving just seconds after the fireballs they launched. A second later, the ruptured gas tanks fed the fireballs, inflating them to massive proportions. The drivers were thrown clear. Two-Face's armored vehicles skidded to a halt. Two-Face stepped out and, surrounded by licking flames, screamed his rage into the night. In the stone bowels of an ancient support arch near the Gotham Bridge, Two-Face stewed in his hideout. The decor of the place was suitably unique, 
It was split right down the middle. On the left half, the decor was extremely cheerful, upbeat, with a look and style that seemed right out of a 1950s sitcom. On the right side, everything was black. Black leather stretched over black metal, and harsh lighting flickered overhead. On each side of the room, there was a woman preparing a meal. The former was sugar. The latter was spice. They were identical, and dressed according to the theme and mood of the respective rooms. "'I've prepared your favorite, mon cher,' cooed Sugar. "'Quail eggs and aspic.' Two-Face rose and examined it approvingly. "'Foie gras. Excellent.' With a disdainful sniff, Spice called over. "'Liver. Don't make me puke.' The girls nodded towards each other, the little game following its usual course. They moved the two tables together, and Harvey sat at the head, and a voice from the dark said, "'I hope you made extra.' Two-Face was on his feet immediately, shoving the table away and pulling out his twin colts. Who the hell? Just a friend. But you can call me. The figure stepped out into the light, slowly, so as not to spook the man who had two guns on him. Two-Face squinted in confusion. He was faced by a gangling individual clad in a lime-green leotard covered with question marks, and he was leaning on a cane with a large question mark for a handle. The Riddler, he said, after a suitably dramatic pause. The Riddler then moved quickly. The moment he had entered, he had seen the twin TVs on either side of the room. "'Have you seen the latest program? he directed the comment to Sugar and Spice. Automatically they both glanced at the TVs, and as they did so, he pressed a stud on the head of his cane. The television sets glowed green, the pictures vanishing and white beams arced out of the sets, spearing straight through Sugar and Spice's heads. Two-Face stared at them, not understanding what he was seeing. He merely watched, transfixed. The Riddler reached for his jacket and removed a receiver from it. He held it out invitingly. This is how I found you. Take a hit and see. It makes one smarter. Two-Face considered it a moment, bringing the receiver up to his head experimentally, and the world was suddenly open to him. The Riddler pointed at Sugar and Spice, who were still mesmerized, and then at Harvey. "'This is your brain on the box,' he said to the former. "'This is your brain on their brain.' Then he pulled the receiver away from Two-Face, who gasped at the separation. Slowly Two-Face's eyes refocused. He grabbed for the receiver, but the Riddler easily kept it out of his reach. "'More,' he said in a strangled voice. The Riddler waggled a finger at him. "'Oh, there's more. But only the first one's free. Here's the concept, Counselor. Crime. My IQ, your AK-47. This is the bargain. You will help me gather production capital so I can produce enough of these. He held up the box. It was in the shape of a stylized question mark with a glowing light in the bottom dot. Enough of these to build an empire that will eclipse Bruce Wayne's forever. And in return, I will help you solve the greatest riddle of all. Who is Batman? Then we'll find him and kill him. Two-Face eyed the Riddler, interest dawning. An intriguing proposition. He pulled out his coin. Clean side, we take your offer. And then he placed the barrel of one of his guns against the Riddler's temple. Scarred side, we blow your head off. The Riddler licked his lips, which were suddenly dry. And as the coin arced through the air, he said what might very well be his last words. Don't rule out the concept of Two out of three. In the Gotham Jewelry Exchange, Two-Face's thugs were hurriedly scooping out handfuls of gems from glass cases and shoving them into bags. Nearby, the Riddler and Two-Face stood over a pallet of black jeweler's felt, which was littered with bright, sparkling diamonds. Two-Face grabbed the pallet and upended it, pouring the diamonds into a loot bag. As the bat signal flared in the sky, the party moved across town. In the Gotham Casino, the guards were struggling with Two-Face's thugs, but they were sorely outnumbered. Batman's eyes narrowed as the sign, Crime in Progress, flashed on his tactical screen. Something seemed a little off, but he couldn't take the time to figure out precisely what it was. He had the feed from police headquarters, and that was all he needed. The Batmobile rolled up to the service entrance of the building where the crime was reported. Batman wasted no time charging up the stairs and smashing through the door. There was a collective shriek from within. Batman stood in the middle, 
of the Curl Up and Die Beauty Salon, which was open late since it was Friday. He looked around for the source of the disturbance. The women didn't seem particularly upset. After their initial astonishment, both beauticians and customers started babbling excitedly, crowding in around Batman, laughing and flirting. Behind his mask, Batman fumed. He wasn't certain which annoyed him more, that he had not gotten his hands on his target, or the kind of field day that the media was going to have with this. With millions in diamonds, cash, and personal effects stolen, said the newscaster, while bizarrely Batman chose to make an appearance in a cross-town beauty parlor. With the late morning sun flooding in through his window, Bruce Wayne adjusted his tie while the morning news aired. He shook his head as the newscaster continued. Witnesses clearly identified Two-Face as the perpetrator and mastermind behind the robbery. However, this station has learned exclusively that Two-Face has a new partner who phoned earlier with the following message. A graphic of a question mark appeared on the screen as the Riddler's voice crowed. Blame Two-Face? I demand equal acclaim for my offense, recognition for my wrongdoings, credit for my crimes. Gotham has a new bad boy in town, and his name is the Riddler. The newscaster came back on, adding, It would seem that Two-Face has now decided, appropriately, that two heads are better than one. Alfred entered Bruce's bedroom carrying coffee and the morning mail. Bruce turned to him and said, I knew scrambling the downlink to misdirect me to the beauty salon was too sophisticated for Harvey alone. Alfred shook his head. A madman calling himself the Riddler. Riddles delivered to Bruce Wayne. Apparently you and Batman have a common enemy, sir. Bruce glanced at the butler, only listening with half an ear as the newscaster continued. On other news, entrepreneur Edward Nigma has signed a lease for Claw Island. Nigma says he plans to break ground on an electronics plant. And there was Nigma, holding up sketches of what his fully refurbished Claw Island would look like. Bruce Wayne barely gave it a glance. Edward Nigma, at that moment the farthest thing from his mind. And also, as it happened, the closest. In the combination garage and gym in Wayne Manor's West Wing, Bruce Wayne found Dick Grayson pummeling a straw-filled action dummy. Dick had drawn in a face on the dummy's head, a smiley face, but there was a vertical line bisecting it. The left half of the face was smiling, while the right half was sneering, with a grossly distorted eye, mouth, and fangs. Dick paused, clearly waiting for Bruce to make some comment. This, of course, Bruce didn't do. Instead, he turned to Dick and said approvingly, in reference to the motorcycle that the teen had been working on, I just started the Black Knight. She sounds great. Why don't you grab the Harley and we'll take a ride? With a sigh, Dick lowered his arms from the punching position. Look, man, I appreciate the gig, but let's leave it at that. We're not going to be buddies, okay? You don't even know me. In a very mild tone, Bruce said, I know the pain that's with you every day. Don't let your love for your family twist into hatred of Two-Face. It's too easy. Look, no offense, man, but I don't think you've got a lot to teach me. Bruce raised an eyebrow and then stepped in front of the dummy. His two left hooks rattled the dummy with ear-shattering impact. His right took off the dummy's head. Dick gaped at the Two-Face stuffed head lying on the ground. Don't be so sure, Bruce informed him. What are you going to do about him, Mr. Wayne? Bruce sat behind his desk, staring at Wayne Enterprises' lawyer, Stu the Exterminator Schoenfeld. Schoenfeld was an intense young man with intense black hair. Do? he asked, going through a variety of documents. Off to the side, Margaret, as always, was manning a phone bank. You mean about Nigma? Yes, sir, said Schoenfeld, in exasperation. He waved documentation and memos around. As near as I can determine, this box he's planning to market, it's from a device that he was creating while he was in our employ. This is the mind control thing, right? asked Bruce. With all due respect, Mr. Wayne, that's a grotesque oversimplification. He rose and crossed over to the far wall, inserting a CD file that he'd been compiling. I've been keeping track of his activities over the past week, sir. Bruce sat back and watched a time-lapse sequence of Claw Island under construction. There, Nigma now was standing in front of the main building with a huge sign that read Nigmatech being raised into place by a crane, a sort of crowning glory. 
Now you can be part of the show, Nigma was proclaiming to the press and onlookers. Nigma Tech brings the joy of 3D entertainment into your own home. Ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you my vision. The box in every home in America, and one day, the world. I've seen the future, and it is me. Bruce was staring into the gaze of Edward Nigma on the screen. And as he looked at the intense desperation of nearly fanatic glee, he couldn't help but feel that his having missed connecting with Nigma was a blessing in disguise. Drop it, okay, Stu? Wayne asked. He turned to Schoenfeld. We might very well be able to take a big bite out of the box, but I don't need the money, Stu. And you know what I suspect I need even less? Extended dealings with or grief from one Edward Nigma. But... Margaret turned from the switchboard and said, Mr. Wayne, Dr. Meridian, online too. Chase, Bruce said as he picked up the phone. Good to hear from you. I just wanted to know how Dick is doing, and for that matter, how you're doing. He thought to himself, oh, he spent the past few weeks pounding dummies, punching bags, walls, anything he can do until his knuckles start to bleed, and then he starts kicking it. Fine, he said aloud. Everything's fine. We're getting along great. You're lying. I'm lying, he agreed. I miss you. I'd really like our schedules to hook up, unless, of course, things have become more serious with you and uh, the other fellow. The line was silent for a moment. Chase, he prompted. I don't know if serious is the right word. Strange might be more appropriate. She hesitated and then said, let me do some schedule juggling and get back to you. Sounds great, he said. As he hung up, Margaret dropped some papers on his desk. On top, Bruce thought he saw a leather-covered book, covered with mud and dirt, clutched to his chest, and the young man held it desperately as, What the? said Bruce. Margaret leaned forward at his exclamation. All she saw was a stack of papers. Bruce rubbed his temples smiled gamely and waved Margaret off. And the screaming of the young man in torment echoed in his head. Chase Meridian's apartment was cramped and cluttered. After letting Bruce in, Chase had gone back into the kitchen and was now looking into a pot of boiling macaroni. Uh, find a spot and clear it off, she suggested. I'll have food up in five minutes. I'll have you know spaghetti is my specialty, she said archly. How did that get to be your specialty? he asked. Because I can't cook anything else. Dick knew there was something going on, but he didn't know what. Bruce and Alfred would occasionally vanish into the mansion, sometimes for hours at a time. He wandered into the study. The place was as huge and intimidating as anywhere else in the joint, and the design was eclectic. Sky-high bookshelves, but with a grandfather clock sandwiched between two of them. Tropical fish, trophies, pictures, pictures over the mantel. That, in fact, did catch Dick's interest. He walked over and stared at the photos. There was a kid who he guessed was Bruce as a boy. Bruce Wayne. Now, there was a strange case. It was clear there was something going on in Wayne's head, but damned if he could tell what it was. He looked around the study and confirmed what he'd suspected. There was no other exit from the place. This struck him as particularly odd, because the other day he'd been looking around the empty study. He'd walked out, but hadn't gotten twenty feet when he heard a faint clanging from within the study. He turned back and been stunned to see Alfred emerge from the room. But he hadn't been there less than a minute ago. He stared at the grandfather clock, stared particularly at the pendulum, the pendulum would have made that exact clanging noise if knocked around. Dick walked over to the clock, looking it over. Hmm, that's how I would do it, he murmured. He opened up the glass cover and started moving the clock's hands, pushing them backwards since, he reasoned, clockwise was the normal motion. He pushed the hands backwards to midnight, on a hunch, and then jumped back as the clock slid smoothly and noiselessly outward. Behind it was a black, darkened entrance into what? 
Thanks again for dinner, said Bruce as he helped Chase clear off the dishes. Also, I appreciate your help on Dick. Can I buy you a hospital wing or something? She laughed lightly and snapped her fingers. Oh, that's right, I forgot. Forgot? She pulled out a small gift-wrapped box and handed it to him. What's this? he said as he opened it. Inside was a small wicker doll, a dream doll. I thought your dreams might need changing, she said. That would be nice. He hesitated, and then he said, My parents were murdered in front of me. I was just a kid. Chase nodded. Her face was carefully composed and neutral. I get flashes in my dreams. I'd gotten used to them, but now there's a new element, one that I don't understand. A, a book. Leather. He paused. The dreams have started coming when I'm awake. She nodded. Bruce, you're describing repressed memories. Images of some forgotten pain trying to surface. It... The phone rang. She moved quickly into the other room, and as she answered it, a pile of papers cascaded to the floor. He went over to help pick the stuff up and saw the first two files on top were about that man, as were the next five articles, news photos, clippings, Every bit of printed material known to mankind about his costumed alter ego was adorning the desk of Dr. Chase Meridian. Damn it! Damn it! Why couldn't he have the right people obsessed with the right aspects of his life? Chase sighed, hung up, and looked at Bruce, ready to turn matters back to business. Then she turned to see what he was staring at. Is that the other man, Doctor? he asked stiffly. All right, she sighed. He's fascinating. Clinically. Why does a man do... And she put her fingers up to the sides of her head, imitating bat ears. This. Then she studied Bruce a moment and said, Okay, look. If you're no longer interested in discussing yourself, you want to try and help me dissect Batman? It'll be challenging. You may even find out something about yourself. Now that would be a treat deadpanned Bruce Wayne. And maybe you'll find out something, too. Bruce Wayne is Batman. Dick had figured it out in no time flat. If the computers, the equipment, and the entire incredible setup weren't enough, certainly the cape that Bruce left draped over a chair was a sufficient tip-off. From one of the caverns up ahead, he heard a clanking. It was the Batmobile. The hood was up. The motor humming softly as Alfred was bent over the mighty black car, making some minor adjustments to the engine. Never had Dick Grayson moved more silently than he did at that point. The cowling on the cockpit was open, and he eased himself in. He studied the dashboard. Everything was clear, easy to find, made sense. If he was in a fight, he didn't want to have to start fumbling around to find weaponry. Alfred slammed the hood, wiping his hands on a white rag he had dangling from his belt. He moved towards the cockpit at just the precise moment that Dick Grayson located the button that would slide the cowling shut. As the butler started to reach in for the purpose of shutting off the engine, the cowling quickly began to slide forward into its locking groove. With a startled yelp, Alfred yanked his arm clear and then, to his horror, caught a glimpse of Dick Grayson's grinning face. "'Don't wait up, Al!' he called as the cowling clicked into place. "'No!' shouted Alfred. Master Grayson, no, get out of there! But by that point it was too late. With a screech of tires, the Batmobile hurtled away, picking up speed with every second. And for just a moment, the polished British butler vanished, to be replaced by a very unpolished and very frantic Alfred Pennyworth. Oh, bugger! exclaimed Alfred. We'll screen some news footage first, said Chase keying up a CD-ROM file on her computer. Of what? Of Batman in combat. Chase brought the first footage up on the screen. Look at the abuse he's taking, Chase observed. He's not just fighting crime. It's as if he's paying some great penance. What crime could he have committed to deserve a life of nightly torture? Bruce hit a key, blanking the screen. So Batman just had a lousy childhood. Is that your diagnosis, Doctor? He started to turn away, and she grabbed his hand as if grasping a life preserver. Why do you throw up that superficial mask? I want to be close, but you won't let me near. 
He moved towards her, and she backed away slightly. You want to know me, Doctor? We're all two people. This side we show daylight, that we keep in shadow. She continued to back up and bumped against a wall. Rage, violence, passion, she whispered, and for a moment he felt himself drawing her into him. Or perhaps it was the other way around. His watch beeped at him. With a slightly strangled grunt, he stepped back and raised the watch to his face. Screen, he said, and the holographic watch face was replaced by the frowning face of Alfred. Yes, Alfred? Aware of Chase's presence, Alfred chose his words carefully. Sorry to bother you, sir. I have some distressing news about Master Dick. I am afraid he's gone travelling. He ran away? Actually, he took the car. Which car? The Jag? The Bentley? No, sir, the other car. Bruce closed his eyes in pain. What's the problem? asked Chase. With a soft moan, he simply replied, Car trouble. In an alley of Arkham Square, the young girl ran with several young toughs in pursuit. One of them knocked her to the ground, and then blinding headlights framed them in the alleyway. They looked up in shock as the Batmobile rolled down towards them. Then the cowling slid back, and there was deathly silence as a caped figure emerged from the cockpit. He leaped down as the punk shrank back, the cape fluttering behind him. Everyone froze. Something seemed off. One of the gang kids leaned forward to the leader and whispered, I thought he'd be taller in person. The leader glared at the intruder and growled, Who the hell are you? Trying to sound ominous, Dick Grayson rumbled, I'm Batman. He took a step forward, but the cape was too long, and he stepped on one of the scalloped edges, yanking it partway off his shoulders. It revealed his less than intimidating sweater and jeans. Damn, did I forget to dress again? They closed in on him then, one of the gang members taking the lead while another swung a length of chain. Dick's hand shot out quickly, and he grabbed it away. He swung it upward, catching the low rung of a fire escape ladder, and just as another of the punks rushed him, he yanked himself into the air. He swung a kick into the punk's face, knocking him flat. With a collective yell, the others dashed off down the alleyway. Dick tossed a salute to the awestruck girl and started towards the car and then he heard a series of shouts and screams that did not bode well. Both he and the girl turned and saw several other dozen bats coming their way. Bats of the wooden variety, being wielded by about thirty punks belonging to the same gang. Dick and the girl dashed toward the other end of the alley, which was barred by a chain-link fence. He reached for the girl and practically tossed her over. Run! he shouted as she rabbited away. Dick leaped for the chain dangling from the fire escape, a fairly good plan, until more of the gang came pouring over the rooftop. He did the only thing he could. He leaped off the balcony, snagged a clothesline, and landed in the midst of the punks, hordes of them tightly packed in the alleyway. He landed on their shoulders, leapfrogging across them, trying to get to the Batmobile and safety. He almost made it. Then one of them managed to grab his foot and pull him down into the midst of the pounding mass of flesh. That was when a dark, caped figure descended from on high. He zeroed in immediately on where Dick had gone down under the bruising fists. Smoke! he called out. Responding instantly to the pre-encoded voice message of its creator, the Batmobile ejected smoke grenades out from its front launcher. Wasting no time, Batman slung his young charge under his arm and carried him to the Batmobile. By the time the smoke had cleared and the chests of the punks had stopped burning, the Batmobile was long gone. Long into the night they were still in the Batcave. Batman chose his words with care. Dick, he said, I tried to tell Two-Face who I was. I only wish... I wish with all my heart there was something I could do to change things. To Bruce's surprise, Dick said, There is. He paused and then said, Let me be part of this. What? It's all I think about every second of the day getting two-face. He took my whole life. But when I was out there tonight, I imagined it was him I was fighting, and all the hurt went away. Understand? Too well. So how do we find him? said Dick, as if Bruce had already acceded to his request. And when we do, you gotta let me be the one to kill him. Listen to me, Dick. Killing damns you. I know. All this isn't about revenge. Dick glanced at a framed headline over Bruce's desk. 
It carried the story of the murder of Bruce's parents. Right. Save the speeches, Bruce. You want to help me? Train me. Let me be your partner. No. Dick eyed Bruce with anger born of pain. You said we're the same. Well, you were right. I'm going to be a part of this, whether you want me to or not. He stormed out, and Bruce watched him go, feeling a lot older. The red carpet had been rolled out for the night at the Ritz-Gotham Hotel. A banner was draped across the front that read, Nigmatech, Imagine the Future. At the curb, folks poured from luxury cars. A battalion of valets scurried about. Bruce stepped out of his Bentley and assisted Chase. Dick vaulted over the back of the car. The hotel was a hive of activity. A band was playing and couples were dancing on an elaborately decorated dance floor. Lining the walls were curtained show booths. Partygoers were being invited to step in and sample the new box. Bruce, Chase, and Dick headed down a large staircase to the center of the ballroom. Gotham High Society, said Dick unenthusiastically. I'm excited. Reporters pressed in close to Edward Nigma. Photographers were snapping pictures, and an avid society writer was tossing questions at him. Suddenly, she spotted a new arrival and called his name. Oh, there's Bruce Wayne, Brucey! Edward stiffened slightly. Before Wayne could get a word out, Edward had draped himself around Bruce's shoulder. Bruce, old man! The press was wondering what it feels like to be outsold, outclassed, outquaffed, and uh, generally outdone in every way. Bruce Wayne merely smiled. Congratulations, Edward. Great party. Edward continued, How humiliating my success must be for you. There you were, a real genius, and yet you couldn't recognize my own. Come, let me show you what could have been ours together. A woman was just stepping into the first booth. She moved in like an astronaut stepping into a capsule, but everyone turned to watch her on a monitor where she was turning and looking down in amazement. She was covered in glittering jewels. My new improved box offers fully interactive holographic fantasies, said Edward. It's real because they believe it to be real. An end to mundanity. Out of the darkness, Nigmatech brings you a life better than life itself, he gestured ahead. Go ahead, try it. Step through to the other side. Edward, Bruce said slowly. If you can introduce images into the mind, what keeps you from drawing images out of the mind? Edward sneered. Too timid to try my machine? Say so. He smiled graciously at Chase. If such cowardice before so fair a lady doesn't embarrass you, shall we dance? Chase was about to refuse, but then she noticed that Bruce, with a subtle nod of his head, was indicating that she should. Obviously, he was interested in her assessment of him, so when Nigma scooped her up in his arms, she did nothing to resist. And now, looking around at Nigma's equipment, Bruce felt his curiosity piqued. He moved to what he thought was an empty, inoperative booth and pulled aside the curtain. He stepped inside. And as he stood mesmerized in the booth, surrounded by the green glow, with a tiny white light focused on his eyes, yet another hollow file was created. It was to be added to the hundreds that had already been assembled this busy, busy night. This one was labeled Bruce Wayne. A miniature schematic of the human brain appeared on a screen, and the box began its guided tour through the graphic landscape of Bruce Wayne's mind. Dick Grayson looked down contemptuously at the array of booths with people going in and out like cuckoos into clocks. Fake reality. It'll never beat the real thing. Then he saw the booths go dark all at once, and only had a second to wonder why before gunfire clattered across the room, and bile rose in his throat as he saw Two-Face swagger into the middle of the floor. Two-Face bellowed, All right, folks, this is an old-fashioned low-tech stick-up. Hand everything over nice and easy and no one gets hurt. Bruce Wayne staggered out of the booth, disoriented, operating completely on instinct. Hearing the commotion, he immediately moved towards a service entrance and shoved the door open. The moment he got outside, he located the Bentley and ducked into it. Emergency, Alfred, he said. But the butler was already pressing a hidden button that flipped open a secret panel in the back. A bat suit was hidden within. 
Dick Grayson bolted into the service kitchen. He heard the pounding of feet from both directions, the unmistakable clacking of bolts being shot home. He looked around desperately and spotted a laundry chute. He dived through it just before thugs appeared. Edward Nigma shoved his way towards Two-Face. You're ruining my party, he said. Are you insane? He stared into Two-Face's mad eyes and said, mm, I withdraw the question. We're sick and tired of waiting for you to deliver Batman, riddle boy. Edward began to sweat. Patience, oh bifurcated one. Screw patience. We want him dead, and nothing brings out the bat like a little mayhem and murder. At that moment, a window exploded inward. Guests ducked back, glass flying over them as Batman swung in. Glass crunched beneath his feet when he landed, and he wasted no time at all. One thug charged Batman, and he heaved him overhead. Then he moved towards a thug who was trying to grab Chase's pearls from around her neck. Excuse me, he growled as he head-butted the thug, knocking him cold. My place, midnight, Chase whispered. Batman spun and engaged another group of thugs. He yanked gas pellets from his belt and hurled them. They exploded at the feet of several thugs, and immediately those went down from the fumes. Batman pulled several small cuffs from his belt and threw them towards more thugs who were advancing on him. The cuffs honed in on them, whipping through the air and securing themselves around the thugs' ankles. They went down hard. Batman ran in the direction that he'd seen Two-Face go. He dashed out onto the balcony and saw Two-Face and his thugs vanishing into an open manhole in the midst of the construction site across the street. Batman threw wide his arms. The glider rods snapped up, drawing his cape taut and into place. He stepped onto the railings of the balcony and leaped off, hurtling down towards the manhole at top speed. The Gotham Subway Museum was planned to be an ancillary part of the new hotel. It would be marvelous and profitable and doomed. Work on the station had already begun. Half the station had been washed down, repainted and retiled. The other half was still dank, dirty and disgusting. Crouching on the tracks below, Two-Face felt right at home. Boys, welcome our guest. Upon the command, the thugs hoisted a translucent red plastic industrial air conditioning tubing, its maw precisely matching the diameter of the open manhole. Batman folded his wings just as he arrived at the manhole, plummeting straight in feet first. He only had a split-second warning that something was wrong, and in this case it wasn't enough, not even for the Batman. He plunged into the red vinyl connector, skidding into the darkness, out of control. His ride ended abruptly. He hurtled out of the tube into a blackened tunnel filled with scaffolding and supports from the work underway and smashed squarely into a wall. Staring into the darkness of the tunnel, Two-Face grabbed an aging valve wheel set in the crumbling wall. He spun it enthusiastically and, in the distance, was rewarded with the sound of gas pouring into the tunnel. He aimed the launcher into the tunnel and cried, "'Fire in the hole, gentlemen!' The thugs scrambled to get out of the way as Two-Face fired the launcher. The grenade slammed into the gas main, and a flaming white fireball erupted, spiraling down the blackened tunnel and searing everything in its path. Two-Face watched with rapt attention as the far end of the tunnel turned into an inferno. There were more explosions, the glorious sounds of debris falling, and no movement. Finally, whispered Two-Face. Then his smirk vanished. Rubble was being shoved aside, and phoenix-like, a caped figure was rising from it. Slowly, Batman lowered his fireproof cloak and began to move forward. Consumed with rage, Two-Face started firing wildly. Why don't you just die? he shrieked. As he spoke, rock and sand from the damaged scaffolding collapsed inward on Batman, knocking him to his knees, pouring in from everywhere. He was driven back from Harvey by a storm of wreckage. Two-Face continued to watch, unblinking, as the ground beneath Batman sucked him down into a quickly filling pit of sand. He managed to yank his grappling gun free from his belt, and he fired a cable into the air. For a moment, Two-Face held his breath, but then the grappling hook clattered back down, nothing above it for it to grip onto. Sand continued to fall, entombing Batman, covering his mouth, his eyes, and finally, his ears. Screeches filled his ears, and they were his own, except he couldn't speak, and he thrust a hand upward, his air running out, his life running out like sands trickling through an overturned hourglass. His hand clutched at something, 
and it was air, but air was notoriously difficult to find a handhold in. A hand gripped his. It was a strong, unwavering grip. It provided him all the support he needed. He was able to dig in the toes of his boots, drive himself upward, up and out. His head broke the surface, sand pouring out of his mask and giving him visibility. He looked up. Dick was dressed in his flying Grayson costume. Don't worry, said Dick through gritted teeth. Just think of it as a day at the beach. A really bad day at the beach. In the depths of the bat cave, Alfred was busy bandaging Bruce as Dick paced. What the hell do you think you were doing? I'm going to be your partner. Bruce shook his head. There's no way. But it was Dick, not Bruce, who was dealing from strength. Whenever the call comes, he said, I'll know. Whenever you go out at night, I'll be watching. And wherever there's a Batman, I'll be right behind him. How are you going to stop me? Bruce held his gaze, and there was something very flat and very dangerous in his eyes. I can stop you. Dick realized that he had stepped over the line. Feeling embarrassed for having done so, he turned his back and stormed out of the Batcave. Bruce shook his head, discouraged. He owed this kid his life, and he knew he couldn't keep doing it alone. But did that mean that he should bring in a partner? Or did it mean that he should stop? Bruce glanced over at a TV screen which was playing the news. He turned up the volume and heard, Batman is a magnet for so-called supervillains. Only when Batman hangs up cape and cowl will Gotham be spared these evildoers' violent vendettas. Bruce Wayne started to laugh. <laughs> Alfred, why do I keep doing this? Alfred reached over and put a hand on Bruce's shoulder. Your parents are avenged. The Wayne Foundation contributes a fortune to anti-crime programs. Police handle much of the villainy. Why, indeed? If I quit, would Two-Face and his crusade? Could I leave the shadows? To spare Dick? To have a life? Friends? Family? Dr. Meridian. Bruce looked up, pain in his eyes. Alfred, she loves Batman, not Bruce Wayne. Go tell her. Tell her how you feel. Pale moonlight shined through the window of Chase Meridian's bedroom. She lay asleep, chest rising and falling evenly. A shadow crossed her face. The French doors to her bedroom opened. A tall and, to some, frightening apparition stood framed against the window. A shadow crossed her face, causing her to stir slightly. Then her eyes opened in narrow slits dream and reality blending seamlessly. She rose slowly from the bed, moonlight playing along her diaphanous gown. She went to him, cape whipping around her. It's two a.m., she whispered. I'd given up on you. His mouth came close to hers, so close, and then their lips met. They broke, and she laughed. I'm sorry, Chase said. It's just, I, I can't believe it. I've imagined this moment ever since I first saw you, and now I have you, and... She turned away from him, walking across the room into the living room. He followed noiselessly. She pushed the roll-top desk, turned on the desk lamp. I've met someone. He's not you, but... She stopped. I hope you can understand. All of the Batman memorabilia on the desk had been replaced by photos and articles about Bruce Wayne... He, uh... <laughs> she cleared her throat. He came to me for advice. I suppose we were in a sort of grey area. I don't want to be in grey areas with him. I want to move into the light. Do you understand? Batman never uttered a word. He merely bowed slightly, moved backward and out. He stood in front of a window and seemed to recede out of it. She watched until he was out of sight. When she spoke, her voice was slow and trembling. I figured it out, of course, but I've been mean-spirited and self-centered and so horrible to him. He needed me. She slammed her fist against the desk. He needed to be loved for himself. He needed me. 
and I was playing head games with him. What the hell kind of doctor am I? What kind of human being am I, for God's sake? And then the sobs came stronger, and she made no effort to stop it. Thank God he came as Batman, so I could speak to the mask instead of to Bruce. Maybe he'll believe. Maybe... She paused and drew in a slow breath. Maybe now we can start talking to each other, instead of at each other. Batman watched Chase Meridian's apartment until the light went out. Then, via his rope, he descended to the waiting Batmobile. He climbed into the cockpit and touched the communications unit. Despite the lateness of the hour, Alfred answered immediately. How did it go, sir? Under his cowl, he smiled. Exactly as I thought it would. She figured it out. Well, sir, said Alfred politely. Then it would seem the two of you are well matched. As Nigma sat on his throne-like seat on Claw Island, Two-Face entered and yanked the device from Edward's head. Our belfry is finally free of bats, he claimed. In response, Nigma shoved a newspaper under Two-Face's faces. The report described how Batman emerged from a manhole, accompanied by another individual also wearing a cape and mask. Not only isn't he dead, observed the Riddler, but he seems to be multiplying. The man's refusal to die is really annoying, bellowed Two-Face. Then he pulled his gun. Someone is going to die today. The Riddler stepped back, looked chagrined. You want to kill me, Harv? Well, all right, go ahead. Too bad about Batman. What about Batman? Two-Face asked suspiciously. What? the Riddler asked. If you could know a man's mind, would you not then own that man? He hit a switch, and suddenly every screen was filled with images of Bruce Wayne stepping into the booth at the party. Would you like to see what my old friend Bruce has in his head? He hit another switch, and something huge and frightening ripped free from the landscape of the schematic brain that had appeared on the screen. A trapped bat, fierce and monstrous. Riddle me this, asked the Riddler. What kind of man has bats on the brain? The two of them began to laugh loud and long. Dick Grayson was positive it was a trick. In the bat cave, Bruce was going from one device to the next, shutting them down. You can't quit, said Dick. There are, there are monsters out there. Dick, I spent my life protecting people I've never met, faces I'll never see. If I let you lose yourself to a life of revenge, all I've lived for will have been for nothing. Batman has to vanish so you can live. Maybe so we all can. You can't decide what I'm going to do with my life. You have to let this go. Trust me, I'm your friend. I don't need a friend. Dick said, temper flaring. I need a partner. Two-Face has to pay. Bruce sighed. Chase is coming to dinner. Come upstairs. We'll talk. Bruce almost reached out for him, but when Dick flinched, he withdrew the hand. Instead, he headed up to the house, leaving Dick alone in the dark, still cave. Dick stood there for a moment. Then he walked slowly to the costume vault. He looked over the array of Batman costumes until he came to a standing figure, separate from the rest his robin costume. The hell with you. I'll do it myself, he said. Half an hour later, carrying everything that he cared about, Dick Grayson rode down the steep mountain road. Far above him, the lights of Wayne Manor twinkled in the night. Seated in front of the fireplace in the living room, Bruce and Chase nursed glasses of vintage champagne. I asked you to come tonight because I need to tell you something, Bruce began. I want to tell you something, too. They hesitated, stopped, then laughed lightly. You go first, said Bruce. Right, she nodded gamely. Bruce, all my life I've been attracted to a certain kind of man, the wrong kind of man. But since I met you, her voice trailed off. God, why am I so nervous? She reached for her wine glass and bumped the vase. Two of the roses fell to the floor. The roses, 
lying there, and they were wilting before his eyes. She could tell instantly that he was gone again, gone into his past. Bruce, what's wrong? It's happening again. Flashes. Images of my parents' death. Your memories are trying to break through. Let them come. I'm, I'm not sure I want to remember. Bruce. And she took a giant step in the direction of what she wanted to tell him. You braved those thugs at the circus. Braved your parents' death. You can brave the past. He leaned back slightly, closing his eyes. There's a book on my father's desk. I'm opening the book, reading. I'm running out into the storm. The book in my hands. Can't hear my screams over the rain. I'm falling into a hole. Okay. What did the book say? October 31st. The last entry. The night they died. Bruce insists on seeing a movie tonight. Oh, I made them go out. I made them take me to the movie. The theater. That alley. It was my fault. I killed them. After I read it, I grabbed the book and ran. I tripped. Fell into a sinkhole. Thought it was the bat that scared me that night, but it wasn't. This is the demon I've spent my life fighting. My own guilt. The fear that I killed them. Oh, God, Bruce, you were a child. You weren't responsible. And it was at that moment that all hell broke loose. Alfred opened the door in answer to the ring and never even saw the cane descending toward him. The thugs stepped over him, two of them picking up his unconscious form and shoving him in a closet. Two-Face snapped his fingers. Move, he said. His thugs started off in all directions. The Riddler headed off through the mansion. Bruce headed into the dining alcove, Chase right behind him, as he heard the commotion. He ran straight into two of Two-Face's thugs. Quickly, he grabbed a silver serving tray, flipped it into one of the thugs' faces, and kicked him in the stomach. Without breaking motion, he slammed the platter into the other thug's head. Then he grabbed Chase's hand, and they dashed out the door, several more henchmen in close pursuit. The Riddler moved slowly through the mansion, holding up his cane in this direction and that, checking the sounding signals being issued from the head. He was looking for a wall with a hidden panel, something that appeared to be solid but had a drop behind it, and in short order he found it. The bat cave was dark with drop cloths over the equipment. He started removing small green bombs from his pouch. The green bombs he had produced were in the shape of bats with demented glee. He twisted each of their little heads, enjoying every single screech. He picked up the first one, its wings flapping furiously, and hurled it into the air. The bat struck the video wall, and a tremendous explosion rocked it. The next one blew the costume vault to hell and gone, and the third detonated in the crime lab. And as he headed out of the cave, the Riddler shouted to any stray bats who might be listening, Tell the fat lady she's on in five! And the moment he was clear of it, the Batmobile exploded. Within seconds, it became a huge, flaming slab of metal. Within the closet into which he'd been tossed, Alfred tried the doorknob, locked. Undeterred, he activated his wrist calm device. 911, he said, and the auto dialer went to work. Bruce and Chase fled up the giant staircase, the thugs one step behind, and Two Face approached the bottom of the stairs, flipping the coin. A chance to live, a chance to die, he intoned. Lady Luck makes her decrees, and we can do naught but slavishly follow. The scarred side of the coin winked up at him. Finally, he said, pulled out his gun, aimed, and fired. At the top of the stairs, the bullet grazed Bruce Wayne's head. Chase shrieked as Bruce pitched back and tumbled the length of the stairs to the bottom. An instant later, several thugs had closed in behind Chase and had her arms pinned. Bruce lay unmoving on the floor. Two-Face stood over him and said, Bruce, my boy, you sure know how to throw a party. The Riddler came dashing in at that moment. In the distance, police sirens could be heard. Okay, he nodded towards Chase. Just grab the bait. Chase was dragged out. The Riddler grinned as he walked over to the unconscious Bruce and dropped a riddle on top of his body before sauntering out the door. And somewhere far below, 
as fire licked through the costume vault, the bat emblems began to burn. And from out of the fire, a huge bat appeared. It staggered, enveloped in flame, its red eyes blazing, and then fell forward and moved no further. The injuries are relatively minor, said the doctor. The shot did cause a concussion. Watch for headaches, memory lapses, odd behavior. I'll check back in a few days. The doctor finished packing up. Alfred led the physician out, then quickly returned to Bruce's bedside. How are you feeling, young man? Well enough. Give me the bad news. He'd rather not have gotten into it so quickly, but it was unavoidable. Alfred said, Master Dick has run away. They have taken Dr. Meridian, and... There was no delicate way to say it. I'm afraid they found the cave, sir. It's been destroyed. Bruce looked up at Alfred with puzzled, narrowed eyes. The cave? What cave? Bruce stared in wonderment at the cave, or what was left of it. There were melted ruins and rubble as far as he could see. Alfred stood silently next to him. I remember my life as Bruce Wayne, but all this, it's like the life of a stranger. Then he paused. There's one other thing I feel. Afraid. It started to tumble back to him. The cave. I remember the cave. A demon. Oh, my God. Alfred. No demons, son. Alfred touched the side of Bruce's head. Your monsters are here. And until you face them, I fear you will spend your life fleeing them. Bruce stood in front of the dark, rocky mouth that led to the smaller part of the cave, the part that he'd first fallen into those many years ago. He insinuated his body through and climbed slowly up into it. Bats. Bats everywhere. Just as he remembered, making the walls and ceiling look as if they were throbbing with life themselves. The infrared goggles were fitted over his face, the cave looking like daylight. He spotted it in far less time than he would have thought. It was there, under an alcove, a large piece of rock that extended and covered it, as if protecting it against the possibility of his eventual return. Slowly, terrified of what he would find, he reached for the book. He turned the pages to the last entry, and there it was, just as he remembered. Bruce insists on seeing a movie tonight. He paused and then noticed that the page was stuck back to back with the next one. Moisture had done it. Carefully, he separated the pages and turned them and found more writing. But Martha and I have our hearts set on Zorro, so Bruce's cartoon will have to wait until next week. He stared at the book in disbelief. Not my fault, he whispered. <laughs> It wasn't my fault. Suddenly in the dark ahead of him, a shape moved. It separated itself from the rest of the shadows, but with his goggles, clear as day, he could see it. Even in day, it was terrifying. Mouth open, to reveal hideous fangs, head moving slowly from side to side, and watching him through red slits, wings huge. And suddenly the monstrosity was airborne, and it was coming for him. He turned, resolved to meet the thing head on, and then something remarkable happened. The bat held its position, staring straight into his eyes, wings spread wide, and Bruce raised his arms to match the aspect of the bat. They faced each other, living mirrors, man and bat, neither entirely sure how much of the other was real. And in the unreality of the cave, they came together. Bats exploded from on high. In the main chamber of the Bat Cave, Alfred reflexively put up his arm to ward them off. They arced all over the ceiling, smashing into each other as if they couldn't move quickly enough. He watched in stupefaction, and then a shadow was cast down at him. He looked up and whispered, Master Bruce? A voice spoke to him, familiar and yet unfamiliar, and it said, 
Batman, Alfred. I'm Batman. In Bruce Wayne's bedroom, Bruce and Alfred stood over the latest riddle. Five little items of an everyday sort. You'll find them all in a tennis court. Bruce picked up a pen and started circling letters in the words. A tennis court. Alfred saw it immediately. Vowels! He turned to the many riddles that the Riddler had left, either with Bruce Wayne or at various locations during his crime spree. But what do a clock, a match, chess pawns, and vowels have in common? Bruce asked. And then something clicked. Every riddle has a number in the question. But what do they mean? What does every maniac want? Bruce asked, and answered his own question. Recognition. And he started arranging and rearranging the numbers. Thirteen, one, eight, and five. Letters in the alphabet, he said suddenly. Thirteen is M. M. R. E. M. R. E. Mr. E. Mystery. And another name for mystery? Conundrum? Hmm. Puzzle? Uh, enigma. Mr. E. Mr. Edward Nigma. They moved through the charred remains of the bat cave, trying to determine what options they had left to them. The small comfort we can take, Alfred, he said, pushing a button on the platform on which the Batmobile's charred frame sat, is that Mr. E didn't know about the cave under the cave. The platform started downward, slowly descending into the subterranean depths where decades before young Bruce Wayne had heard water running. What now, sir? Claw Island, Nigma's headquarters. I'm sure that's where they're keeping chase. He paused and said, Are all the bat suits destroyed? All except the prototype, but we haven't had a successful test yet. Bruce smiled. You know what, Alfred? I'm feeling lucky tonight. The young man stood in the cave, looking around at the wreckage. His black cape was draped around him as he surveyed the wreckage. He was wearing a red armored vest, green tights, and knee armor. A utility belt was buckled around his middle, and he wore flexible black boots. A small R decorated his chest plate, and a mask covered his features. So, this is why he hasn't answered the signal, he said. He felt dread creeping through him. Then he noticed the platform for the Batmobile was gone entirely. He walked over to it and looked down, and he heard voices from below echoing up to him. He unsnapped a grappling hook and length of cable from his utility belt, anchored it firmly, and then jumped down into the darkness. Batman emerged from the shadows, his armor bulkier, his cowl more fearsome-looking. Alfred stared at him. He certainly looked more intimidating. What do you suggest, Alfred? By sea or by air? Why not both? But the response had not been from Alfred. They turned to see the red and green clad form of Dick Grayson drop down a few feet away. The two costumed individuals studied each other. Dick, where did you get that suit? he asked finally. It was Alfred who said, I, um, took the liberty, sir. What's the R stand for? Robin. He hesitated. I thought you could use some help. Two against two are better odds, Batman allowed. But your attitude has changed, Robin put in. Whatever happens, I won't kill him. A friend taught me that. Not just a friend. Bruce extended his hand. A partner. The walk up to the rooftop of police headquarters had been the longest Gordon had ever made. He stood next to Detective Bullock, the policeman on watch, and tapped the signal. He's not coming. Shut it down. Bullock reached for the switch, and suddenly a roar cut through the night. The bat signal was coming closer. 
The great black shape grew closer and closer, and then all of a sudden, the bat wing burst through it, buzzing police headquarters and dipping a wing to Gordon. A triumphant Gordon saluted as the bat wing arced up and in the direction of Gotham Harbor. And in the waters of the harbor itself, Robin steered the bat boat across the still waters. Claw Island loomed before him. Atop Claw Island, searchlights popped on one by one, flooding the water with light. Within, the Riddler and Two-Face were playing electronic battleship. The Riddler studied the board. A-14. Hit! Mortars exploded from the top of Claw Island, angling down toward the batboat. Robin cut the ship hard to starboard, and water spouted high in the sky behind him. Another explosion to stern. They were getting his range, and Robin knew that he was in serious trouble. Then the water in front of him erupted in a mountainous geyser, and Robin was blown back out of the batboat. A mortar struck the batboat square amidships and blew it to bits. A hit, said Two-Face, looking disappointed. You sank our battleship. Beneath the waters of Gotham City, Robin shoved a rebreather into his mouth and started to swim towards Claw Island. A stream of armed frogmen started converging on him from all sides, and he twisted frantically out of the way as a spear shot past him, leaving a tiny trail of bubbles behind him. Robin figured that maybe he had one more good dodge in him before he got shish -kebobbed. Then he looked up as the roar of an engine alerted him to the presence of the Batwing. The air vessel angled down toward Robin, and he allowed himself some measure of hope. Then laser beams from the top of Riddler's stronghold blasted outward, neatly severing one of the plane's wings. The plane spiraled downward, crashing into the water and sinking without a trace. And that was when the frogmen caught up with Robin. They dragged him under, the water swallowing him, and he struggled furiously, lashing out with his hands, kicking desperately. Robin twisted, ripped the mask off one of the frogmen, yanked the breathing tube out of another's mouth, but more converged on him, grabbing his arms and legs, and now more were approaching with knives. Suddenly, one of the frogmen gestured frantically, and they all turned to see what he was indicating. It was impossible to miss. Speeding towards them, through the water, was the remains of the batwing, except that, incredibly, even miraculously, it had transformed into something else. The other wing had telescoped inward, and sleek fins had now slid into place. The Bat-Sub, for want of another name, approached at top speed to aid the beleaguered team. With a roar and rush of water, a black torpedo streaked towards them, shot out of the Bat-Sub. A torpedo with arms. That's what one of the frogmen judged it to be, as a capeless Batman shot past him, snagged the struggling Robin with one hand, and with the other released a large net. The guided net ensnared the frogmen. They tried to slice it open with their knives, but didn't even come close to cutting through it. Batman and Robin shot straight toward the surface. When they broke the water, Robin gasped for air, and moments later clambered up to the rocky shore of Claw Island. Batman came up several yards behind. As he did so, he heard Robin exclaim, Holy rusted metal, Batman! What? Robin took a few steps forward, kneeling. The ground! It's metal! And it's full of holes! You know, holy! Oh! He looked around. This place was a refueling station for subs during the war. Just as Batman started to climb out of the water, he heard a grinding of motors and a horrible crunching noise. He looked upward as Robin started to rise into the air. The island was situated atop a tremendous cylindrical oil tank, rising quickly out of the water. Batman was left behind on a necklace of jutting rocks as Robin, with the rest of Claw Island, ascended higher and faster. It was already higher than Batman's wire-poon gun could shoot a grappling hook. Looking around desperately for some means of access, he spotted a rusted panel on the giant metal structure. He moved quickly to it, ripped it free, and climbed inside. Robin looked down at the water surging far below him. That was when a silky voice said, The circus boy, right? He spun and stared straight at Two-Face. Robin leaped at him. Two-Face sidestepped and landed on top of him, slamming him viciously in the head. He raised his blade over the dazed Robin and brought it down fast. At the last second, Robin rolled clear. He backflipped, kicking Two-Face hard in the head. For my mother, he shouted. As Two-Face staggered, Robin kicked him again and again. For my father, for Chris. He knocked Two-Face to his knees and said tightly, For me, he smashed Two-Face in the chin, sending him rolling down the slope. 
At the last second, Two-Face grabbed a jagged outcropping of rock on the island's edge, hanging on for dear life, feet kicking wildly over the abyss. See you in hell! Two-Face spat. Then the rock he was clutching began to slide, and Two-Face started to fall. He made it two feet, and then Robin's hand grabbed him. No, he said. I'd rather see you in jail. And with that, he hauled Two-Face to safety. And suddenly, there was a gun in Two-Face's hand. It was pressed against the flesh between Robin's eyes. A mistake, said Two-Face, and he cocked the trigger. The interior of the cylinder was a world of spinning, glowing question marks. A series of steel gratings at intervals of a hundred feet rose the height of the cylinder. Each grating had a trap door through which Batman could gain entry. But now the grating on which he was standing was being sealed beneath him electronically, and suddenly the upper grating began moving down toward him. It left him only one option. He thumbed a button on his utility belt, painfully aware that the last time he'd tested the device he'd almost set himself on fire. His costume vibrated. The thrusters hurled him upwards towards the descending grate. The descending grating and ascending Batman collided, Batman smashing through it. The metal wrenched free of the cylinder sides, clattering downwards. He hung there for a moment, then he hoisted himself upward, shoved his way through a rusting access hatch to face a weird haircut that belonged to the Riddler. He was seated on his throne, which was slowly rotating. Extending from the back of his throne was a huge antenna stretching up into the night sky. A ring of light encircled him, feeding even more brain power into him. No more tricks, Edward, said Batman. Release Chase. This is between you and me. Two-Face stepped from behind the Riddler's throne. And me! And me! In the control room, Batman saw screens with schematics of flickering brains. You've been sucking Gotham's brain waves. You've devised a way to map the human brain, he said, to read men's minds. The Riddler's voice started to rise, becoming louder, more demented. No secret is safe from my watchful electronic eye, he said. I will rule the planet. Edward Enigma has become a god. His voice echoed throughout the room. He waited until the reverberations had stopped, and then he turned to Batman. By the way, B-Man, I've got your number. I've seen your mind, freak. The Riddler now stood to his feet and released the drapes to one of the two curtain-draped cylinders suspended overhead. The curtain rose to reveal Chase within the tube, bound and unconscious. The captivating Dr. Chase Meridian. She enjoys hiking, getting her nails done, and foolishly hopes to be the love of your civilian life. Batman knew even before the rising curtain displayed it that within the other tube would be... Batman's one and only partner, said the Riddler. He pressed a button to reveal the waiting trap doors that slid open beneath Chase and Robin's cylinders. Then he pointed to a button on the armrest of his chair. A simple touch, and five seconds later, these two players are gull-feed on the rocks below, he said. So, who will it be, your love or your partner? Edward, you've become a monster. I'm sorry, said the Riddler. Your answer must be in the form of a question. And his finger went towards the button. Batman started walking toward the two cylinders. He heard a soft chuckle from Two-Face and froze. He studied the floor carefully, closed his eyes, and felt a gentle breeze wafting from in front of him. Wait, I have a riddle for you, Batman said. For me? Really? Tell me. I see without feeling. To me, darkness is as clear as daylight. Who am I? Oh, please, you're as blind as a bat. Exactly. Batman slammed his utility belt, released a batarang with a high-energy charge, and hurled it at the antenna. The batarang smashed into the antenna, and a massive charge of electrons fed into the transceiver, overloading them. No! screamed the Riddler as he was bombarded with massive pulses of neural energy. His entire head started to distort, fluctuate in size, and waver, and then he collapsed, slumping against the button and Robin and Chase Meridian fell through their cylinders, the drop yawning before them.
But the tubes hadn't opened simultaneously. They'd opened sequentially, no more than a second between the two. But it might be all Batman needed. In that instant, two metal lids shut over Batman's eyes. Small radar screens appeared on the back of Batman's eyepiece. As he had thought, there was no floor in front of him, only a fake holographic representation of one, and the wild crisscross of interconnected steel beams between the Riddler's lair and the crashing ocean below. Batman leaped forward and hurled the Batarang all in the same motion. As the Batarang cable snapped taut, he swung down and caught Chase in an arc, depositing her on a steel beam before preparing to leap after Robin. He looked down. No sign. Robin! What you want? He looked up his radar zeroing in. Robin was wedged in the bottom of the tube, his arms and legs pushing against either side. He started to climb the girder toward Robin when Two-Face appeared on the beam in front of him. He had a halogen light strapped to his head, blinding Batman's sensors. He brandished his gun. All oh, those heroics for nothing! No more curtains, one and two! Just plain curtains! Haven't you forgotten something, Harvey? called out Batman. You're always of two minds about everything. To Two-Face's chagrin, he realized that Batman was right. He took out his coin and flipped it, and Batman threw a Batarang. The Batarang clipped the coin and sent it off its arc, and Harvey lunged for it. He snatched it out of mid-air, still clutching his gun, and then he fell. Two yards. Then Two-Face slammed against one of the lower girders, and now he twisted himself around, bracing his feet, clinging tenaciously, like a bat. Robin shouted down, you go round acting like that coin is making all the decisions. But it's not the coin. It's you. You're so damned gutless I feel sorry for you. With a snarl, Two-Face brought his gun up and aimed it at Robin. Robin pressed on relentlessly. You don't have the guts to admit Batman was human and couldn't do everything. You don't have the guts to admit you might have been at all responsible. What's that coin say about you, hotshot? Go on, do it. Decide for yourself about yourself, you pathetic bastard. Two-Face stared up at him for an eternity as the water crashed below. Then he flipped the coin. It spun, hanging there in the night, and then descended. Two-Face plucked it out of the air, looked at it. He shook his head, and then he released his hold on the girder. He made no sound as he descended, none at all. There was dead silence. Ah! I didn't want to do that, said Robin slowly. I... I killed him. No, you just showed Two-Face his real face. The rest was his decision. Maybe his first genuine decision in years. A lonely figure, Edward Nigma, stood trying to piece together the charred fragments of his machinery his voice was small, lost. Why can't I kill you? <laughs> Too many questions. Why you and not me? Why me? Why? His scalp was blistered and burned. Pathetic, whimpering and mad. He stared at the pieces of his machinery as they crumbled in his hand. Batman reached down for the Riddler, who turned and looked up at him and shrieked, for descending towards him was the ravenous face of a hideous, demonic, giant bat. Surprisingly, it was a quiet night at Arkham Asylum, except for the screaming of one inmate Dr. Burton, the chief psychiatrist, walked down the hallways of the maximum security wing, Chase Meridian at his side. Edward Nigma has been screaming for hours that he knows the true identity of Batman, Burton informed her. Really? said Chase, her voice neutral. They reached cell 22, and Chase peered in. Edward, it's Dr. Chase Meridian. Do you remember me? <laughs> How could I forget? Dr. Burton tells me you know who Batman is. Edward giggled gleefully. <laughs> yes, I know. Edward, 
Who is Batman? Suddenly, a huge silhouette of a bat appeared on the cell of the padded wall. Into it leaped Edward, the sleeves of his straight jacket madly flapping like the wings of a bat. I am Batman! <laughs> Doctors Burton and Meridian walked quickly away, the howls and cackles of Edward's demented glee ringing behind them. Chase emerged from Arkham Asylum to find Bruce waiting with the Bentley, holding the rear door open. He's lost all contact with reality, she said. Your secret is safe. Bruce smiled and then reached into his coat pocket and handed her a small wicker figure, the dream doll. Thank you, he said. I don't need it any more. My dreams are all good dreams now. They climbed into the Bentley, pausing to kiss. The car rolled away from Arkham and down the hill. And that was when the bat signal flared in the air. Don't work too late, said Chase. Minutes later, Chase Meridian was the sole passenger in the car with Alfred at the wheel. She stared up at the bat signal burning against the sky. Does it ever end, Alfred? Alfred chuckled softly. No, miss. Not in this lifetime. And high above the city, crouched on the edge of a gargoyle-lined building, Batman looked out over his city. He didn't even have to glance behind him to know that Robin was nearby. Their capes billowed in the breeze as they swung off across the skyline, twin guardians of the night. The darkness opened up to them, and they were gone. This has been a Time Warner Audiobooks production of Batman Forever, adapted by Peter David, based on a screenplay written by Lee Batchelor, Janet Scott Batchelor, and Akiva Goldman. Read for you by Renee Abergenois. Produced by Maya Thomas and directed by Jill Demby Guest. The Batman theme composed by Danny Elfman, courtesy of Warner Tamerlane Publishing Corporation, BMI. Tape edited, mixed, and mastered by Andrew Padgett.